afternoon and welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, May 18th, 2023. I'm calling the meeting to order at 4 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, and it is open to the public. Trustee Hunt, do we have any public input on closed session items only? At this time, the board will adjourn to closed session at 4 p.m. and return at 5.30 p.m. Thank you.
evening, everyone, and welcome to the Board of Education meeting for Thursday, May 18th, 2023. I'm calling our meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed at the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. A limited overflow meeting room with a television monitor is available uh, since we're, I think we are at capacity here in the board room. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD board meeting YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they'll be happy to assist you. Uh, I would like to report on uh, actions the board took during closed session uh, regarding employee appointments. Uh, the board took action to approve the appointment of Christina DeFalco Hoff as the Director of Business Services, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Hill to introduce her. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, Christina Nikki DeFalco Hoff is our new Director of Business Services. After beginning her tenure with Riverside Unified as Fiscal Services Manager for Payroll in 2020, and after being promoted to Assistant Director of Business Services in June, she's now our new director. She brings to her role eight years of district-level fiscal services management experience with accounting, budgeting, accounts payable, payroll, district-wide attendance accounting, health and welfare, benefits, and associated student body accounts. Prior to coming to RUSD, Nikki served as supervisor of fiscal services for Banning Unified. And in that role, um, she did a lot of things <laughs> that I just listed. Uh, in addition, she holds an Association of California School Administrators Director of Fiscal Services certificate. So welcome, Nikki. You have uh, family here? It's just you. Well, even more. One more clap for you. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent Hell. Congratulations again, Nikki. At this time, our Pledge of Allegiance will be provided by video and will feature Isabella Prieto, who is a sixth grade student from Magnolia Elementary School. If you could turn your attention to the video. Hi, my name is Isabella. Something interesting about me is that I love slots. My teacher is Ms. Silva and my principal is Ms. Gore. Can we all put our right hand over our heart? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you to Isabella from Magnolia for that, uh, leading us in the pledge. Our, we'll now turn to our student performance, which will also be provided by video and will feature the finale of the University Heights Cluster Elementary Concert on May 4th, 2023, which featured over 300 performers from elementary, middle, and high schools across the district. Good evening. President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. My name is David Perez from John Duffin Hill High School. Um, my name is Alberto Samudio from University of High School. My name is Bryson Lewis from University of Elementary. Tonight's performance includes a number of schools from our district, including John Duffin High School, uh, University of High School, Highland, Emerson Elementary, High Grove, and Fellow. Today we'll be performing Power Up for you, and we hope you enjoy.
great job uh, again to the University Heights Cluster Elementary uh, performers. So we will now shift to our special recognition items. Uh, we will be recognizing various CIF recipients from RUSD, including the Ramona girls soccer team and coaches from both Ramona and King High School. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sosa now to begin this special presentation for us. Dr. Sosa. Hello, ah, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, board members and public. We're very pleased to be able to share uh, two groups of CIF award winners. First, I'd like to start with our Ramona High School girls soccer team. The Ramona High School girls soccer team is being recognized tonight for their amazing accomplishment of being the first girls team in Ramona High School history to be crowned CIF champions. The Ramona soccer team won Division VI CIF Championship, and they were runners-up in the prestigious CIF State Regional Championship game. We are so proud of them and their hard work with their coaches. Let's give them another big round of applause. <laughs> Next, we were very, very pleased to be able to have two of our coaches here in the district be recognized as CIF Model Coaches of the Year. The CIF Model Coaching Award is designed to recognize coaches that have served as a positive role model in their schools and communities. These are also individuals who, who have exhibited traits that are in alignment with the 16 principles CIF has for pursuing victory with honor. This year, Riverside Unified had two of the 14 coaches that were recognized across the entire state of California. That is a huge, huge honor, and we are so proud for these staff members. First, I'd like to recognize Ms. Laura Shiner. She's from Ramona High School, softball. She couldn't be here with us tonight, but I'd like to read a short bio, and then we will give her our congratulations. Stand in her place. Very good. She looks exactly like this, except nothing like this. <laughs> coach Shiner is a model PE teacher and softball coach at Ramona High School with a steadfast philosophy of providing a quality experience for all of her student athletes. She diligently advocates for all students and is innovative in ways to reach staff, students, and all so they can benefit. Simply put, by one of her colleagues who nominated her for, for this honor, she is the best and most grounded person to work with. We give a hearty district congratulations to Coach Laura Shiner. We had another coach who was honored as well, if I could call Mr. Todd Mapes up. Coach, coach Mapes has served as a PE teacher and soccer coach at Martin Luther King High School for 24 years. Both he and his student athletes in his charge demonstrate sportsmanship, work ethic, and positive behavior every time they come to class or they hit the pitch. One of the colleagues who nominated him said this, more than anything else, he is a teacher of the game. He actively teaches the lessons of life that education-based athletics has to offer. Please join me in congratulating Coach Todd Mapes. Thank you. Thank you. Coach? Coach, would you like to say anything? Uh, All right. Thank you. He, he got his 400th win this year, by the way. Coach Mapes got his 400th win this year with his team. Congratulations. We are just so excited about the accomplishments of our student athletes and the coaches that lead them. Thank you for allowing us to uh, honor them today. So, do we want to call for the picture, pictures? Okay. Pictures? Yeah. 
Yeah, we would like to invite the team to the stage uh, for a photo. Do you want to do it up there or do you want to do it here? Yes, up there. Congratulations, 
again to uh, the Ramona Girls soccer team as well as uh, Coach Mapes and everyone for their great efforts. We're now uh, going to shift to our outstanding service to our student board members, and we're very fortunate to have here on the dais with us Kellen Briscoe, so welcome. We are delighted to be able to recognize our three student board members who have done a superb job this year. They have taken the lead on projects, participated on several committees, and have just overall done a fantastic job of bringing the voice for our over 40,000 students throughout the school district. Uh, in a, in a very admirable fashion. Let's go ahead and bring up the presentation now, and I invite each of them to come up to the podium. Yeah. So uh, we'll actually have them each, one at a time, provide a few thoughts about what they have learned this past year about governance, and maybe they can share with us what their plans are also for the future. After they have each had the opportunity to speak, we will provide them with a plaque and ask them to take a picture with us. Unfortunately, Abi is not available to attend the meeting tonight, but we thank him for his service to the board. Uh, we'll begin with Karina James uh, from Poly High School. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. I wanted to start off by saying thank you to each and every one of you for helping to guide me through the student board member journey. Getting to know a little bit about each of you and working beside you has been an experience that I won't forget. I want to thank my principal, Mr. Hansen, for providing me with this amazing opportunity to serve on the board and for trusting me to represent not only Polly but the students of this district. A very big thank you to Ms. Martin for... Um, without you, I would have been so lost. You kept me on my toes and prepared me for anything and everything thrown my way, and I'm very grateful for you. And of course, thank you to my fellow student board members. You made this experience unforgettable, and I wish you both the best in the future. I'm truly grateful for this experience. Seeing the ins and outs of our district is an amazing thing, and to see how important the voices of the community and students are to the success of this district is encouraging. As for my plans for the future, I have committed to play softball at the Division I level at the University of Central Florida, where I'm going to major in kinesiology. Thank you. Hello, esteemed board members. My time as an RUSD board member has been one of the most rewarding and pleasant experiences for me. It really fuels my uh, passion for advocacy. As a person, I love being involved with the people around me, and being in a room filled with people who are part of my community is such a beautiful thing. When I first w when I first found out that I was going to be a student board member, I had so many teachers say things like, congratulations, Lauren, that's amazing, but good luck at those meetings that run until 11 p.m. on a school night. <laughs> Um, but honestly, I'll say that there's never a dull moment in this room. There's never a dull meeting. And each person, presentation, etc., holds a purpose that is something extremely special. I have so much love for the district. And if you ask anyone I know, the happiest I am is right after a board meeting. So uh, as for my plans after graduation, I'm still committed to UC Berkeley. Um, and I will be attending it in the fall. I still plan on majoring in political science. However, I'm going to possibly pursue a minor or double major in public health. And um, after that, I still plan to go to law school and to practice uh, malpractice law. And um, ultimate goal is to maybe make an NGO or do something political. So thank everyone so much for this opportunity. And that's it. Thank you both, uh, Lauren, Corinna. Uh, before we uh, do the presentation, we do have a public uh, comment uh, input on this item from Roy Bleckert. Is Roy here in the... Oh. Okay. Okay, well, we'll do the presentation, and uh, if they're available, we can address them uh, at that matter. So if you can uh, please join us on the stage. Thank you.
Hi, Mr. Bucker? Yes, that's me. Okay, if you could, if we could please put uh, three minutes. Okay, uh, please proceed. Headed down from my native area, the barrio of Edgemont, to grace your meeting today, but I thought, and I saw this on the agenda, and I'd like to congratulate those students who sat on the board, the ones that will be coming in. There's, you will learn, and you have learned, a lot sitting in this board. And it will serve you well, no matter what your endeavors are. You look at it because what you will learn is one thing that I've said many times. And I've had a little bit of experience in the communications industry because I'm on the radio on KMET 1490 from 5.30 to 6, Monday through Friday here in the IE. But you can have all the great ideas in the world. 98.7% of them are going nowhere unless you learn how to communicate them. The second part is, the process we're doing right here, your government. Your government can stifle you, take your dreams and smash them. And we have a lot of examples of that, and we're going to be dealing with this more later on. But it's your civic responsibility to come up here and do this. And you will be the leaders in the future that we will depend on to keep our republic free to keep it where you can have the best opportunity that you can have, and that you will carry on the legacy that built the greatest country in the history of the world. So I wish you all well in your future endeavors, and I hope and I know you will take these lessons with you that you've learned in your formative years and apply them, and I hope and I'm almost confident you will do it, to make a better life for all of us. So when we look at this, that's why this is an, very important for the class that's coming in. It's very important to learn that and do not take no for an answer. Do not let them push you around. Do not let them maneuver you. If you think you're right, stand your ground. Don't let them push you around. Don't let them tell you because there are a lot of forces out there that will try and get you off track, try to put the advantage on them on them and take it away from you and your family and your area. Don't let them do it. And I think that's one of the most important lessons the, the current student members have learned and hopefully the lesson that the incoming students coming in will have the great opportunity you and your colleagues had in this moment. I thank you for the, your service on there and the service of the other student members on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll now proceed to uh, presentations to the board. Uh, we are very happy to introduce everyone to our new 2023-2024 student board members. They're a stellar group of young people, and I know that Dr. Noemi Hernandez-Alexander participated in the interview process, along with student board members Abi and Lauren. So let's bring up the presentation and I invite each of them to come up to the podium. Okay, and so I'm actually gonna turn it over to Superintendent Hill now to introduce each student. Hi there. <laughs> uh, our term one student board member is Odera Arene, who will be a senior at Martin Luther King High School next year. Odera is a Nigerian-American student who has been attending RUSD since 2020. He's very involved at Martin Luther King High School where he is ASB Commissioner of Recognition and the President of Model United Nations and COSMOS, a UCR Internship Science Fair Competition Club. That's a mouthful. He is a musician who has played for eight years and participates in his school's vocal jazz group and jazz combo. As an active member of the community, he is proud to represent his peers all across the district while serving on the board. After high school, Odera plans on attending a four-year university to major in physics and then enter medical school in, hope, in hopes of becoming a doctor. Welcome, Odera. Uh, 
thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to serve my community. Um, I hope to use my position to uh, better address the different perspectives all across the district and overall just make the community a better place for uh, students, uh, parents, and everyone here at Riverside. Thank you. Thank you. Our term two board, student board member is Bibi Naz Nami. So she would join us. Hi, Bibi. Bibi Naz is a student leader at John W. North High School, where she has been deeply involved in student government, theater, and is also a diploma candidate with the International Baccalaureate Program. Outside of school, she is involved in her community as a member of the Assistance League of Riverside and as a teen advocate for poetry and prose through the Imperfect Poets. She believes that her ability in taking on such roles has only been derivative of the support of those around her and especially the environment provided by her community. She hopes that through her time on the board, she will be able to improve support for her peers and effectively communicate their concerns in order to create an equitable climate for success. In the future, Bibi Nas hopes to continue improving the well-being of those around her through her advocacy. Welcome, Bibi. Hi, I wanted to say that I'm not only very excited to take on this role, but I am extremely honored to have the responsibility of serving as a voice for my peers at John W. North High School, as well as my peers across the district in being able to communicate their concerns and ideas at the district level. Thank you. You're welcome. Our term three student board member is Grace Williams. <laughs> Grace will be a senior at Arlington High next school year. Grace is a driven Italian Filipina mestiza who has lived in Riverside her whole life. She is dedicated to serving her community and has a passion for helping others. Grace is a scholar athlete on her campus and has been a four year varsity starter in girls basketball. She was also elected to the 2023-24 president of the biomedical science program and health occupations program at Arlington High School and has competed at the international level in health occupations for biomedical debate. She has also become the 2324 vice president of Link Crew. Grace plans to go to a four year college or university majoring in biology, which will help her keep on track to pursue her career of becoming a doctor. Outside of school, Grace takes an active role in her Seventh-day Adventist church through sports leagues, singing, and community service. She is excited to lead as a student board member of RUSD. Welcome, Grace. Hi, my name is Gracie. I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to working with all of you. I'm also looking forward to learning so much from everybody here. Um, thank you that I could um, get this opportunity to serve other people. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> I want to express our congratulations to uh, Odera, Bibi Naz, and Grace, uh, all for your le leadership and to take this initiative. We won't be taking photos at this time because they are taking their pictures tonight prior uh, to the board meeting. Uh, but welcome, and you're uh, welcome to stay. It's a public meeting, but if you, know, if you need to uh, do homework or whatever you need to do, just feel free to also leave, uh, to leave if you're comfortable. So th thank you. Uh, we'll now shift to our district group reports. Our first group report tonight will be provided by Ms. Anayi Chang, the president of California School Employees Association. Well, welcome, Anna. Hey, guys. Hey, good afternoon. Good evening. All righty. 
Good evening, Superintendent Renee Hill, President Angela Farouk, distinguished board members, and everyone here tonight. First, I want to thank all the board members, members of Executive Cabinet, Chief of Staff, and Director of Classified Personnel for shadowing classified workers this year. If you're not aware, CSEA Chapter 506, Riverside Unified School District, has been chosen as one of the 10 chapters statewide to participate in the 2023 Appreciating Classified Employees, or ACE program by CSEA. This is big news for us here in Riverside because out of 10 areas, 100 regions, and 750 chapters, Riverside Chapter 506 was selected. I would like to recognize the following employees participating in the event. Translator Maria Hernandez de Rodriguez, Elementary Library Media Assistant Margie Valdez, Registrar Robert Arzate, Elementary Kitchen Operator Erica Wecker, Health Assistant Amanda Embre, Nutrition Specialist Ginko Luter, Campus Supervisor Ruben Avila, Instructional Assistant Special Education 2 Marta Muniz, Grounds Irrigation Worker Jesse Martinez, Carpenter Mike Lopez, Accounting Assistant Davina Cecina, Assessment Technician Diana Ritchie, Head Custodian Marcy Frias, and Secondary Library Media Assistant Kimberly Smith. All of you have made this possible, and I would like to personally thank the board, cabinet, Chief of Staff and Director of Classified Personnel for taking the time out of your busy day to work side by side and observe all that these people do on a daily basis. With that being said, I would like to present this plaque to RUSD and acknowledge the strong participation between classified employees and school district and the school district together. Together we create a safe and healthy educational environment. And this is This is for all you guys, for everybody, for the whole district. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> and thank you. Yes, you're welcome. All right. So, next, the scholarship committee has selected three 2023 recipients for the $500 scholarship. Thank you all that participated, and congratulations to the winners. Equally important, the CEW, or Classified School Employees Week Picnic Committee, is ready for the annual picnic. This Saturday, May 20th, at Grant Education Center, I would like to personally extend an invitation to all you to come out, enjoy some food, raffles, and fun. Additionally, 18 delegates have been nominated and elected to attend the CSEA annual conference this year in Reno, Nevada. For those that are not aware, CSEA holds an annual conference where we conduct union business, read resolutions, debate, and ratify. This will take place from Monday, July 24th and ending July 29th. Again, you guys are all invited to attend our conference as guests. Also, we want to thank RUSD for allowing us to provide the previous teacher laptops as replacement laptops to our classified who currently have only obsolete laptops. Soon, our hope is to provide previous teacher laptops to any classified staff, and not just those lucky enough to have been given an obsolete laptop by a sympathetic teacher or administrator. Lastly, unfortunately, we have concerns from our classified members, in particular, translators who are working out of their job description, occupational trainers, and vision service members voicing out for fair, equitable wages. In addition, our SAP student assistant plan counselors who are advocating for team equity for crisis assessments and central kitchen continuous concerns. Also an ongoing issue that that certain department for overtime. We are working together with the district on these concerns to find a solution for all. Thank you and that concludes my report for CSEA chapter 506, go Lakers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for your thank leadership. Thank you, guys. Good night. Ne next, I'd like to invite Ms. Laura Bowling, president of Riverside City Teachers Association, to provide her report. Welcome, Ms. Bowling. I didn't bring a plaque. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'll put that down for next year. 
<clears throat> Good evening, President Froke, Su Superintendent Hill, and board members and members of the cabinet. As the year closes, it's important to reflect on the year we spent together. I've had the pleasure of sharing the experience of RUSD educators, both good and bad. The end of the year all also offers us the opportunity to look forward in the next school year and hope, for, and hope and positivity. Over my past year of presentations, I brought up the lack of aids, how discipline is affecting all of our educators and students, and the amount of actual time leaders spend on the job at their site and at their home. A new school year offers the opportunity to invest in our students and educators right at the start of the school year. Discipline has been an overwhelming issue at our campuses, and educators want to be a part of the solution. Having a discipline committee at every school site would go a long way to make sure that there is a whole team approach to helping students make good decisions at our schools. Educators and administrators working collaboratively to solve the discipline issues that may be unique to their school site. This must be a, be a collaboration effort. I'm hoping the district provides the guidance to facilitate these important conversations. I would like to end this year with an opportunity to reflect and strategize for the upcoming year to assure that each and every one of our educators feel safe and accepted at their work site. I believe wholeheartedly that teacher safety is as, as important as student safety. It is so easy for some to criticize the teaching profession. Take a minute and walk in their shoes. There, there are no two days alike. Every day a teacher opens their door to struggles. They are faced with unique and challenging obstacles. Educators learn how to meet students where they are and to navigate issues that originate outside of the classroom. As they work to guide students to be the best they can be, we have to remember that we, we are all in a profession of people. Everyone has a vested interest in student success, and that's what works best when we are collaborative in the process. It is very easy to point a finger or lay blame on others, but we continue to encourage the community to be a part of the team. Trust the educator in the classroom to be the expert that they are and support them by working with them and not against them. Educators are humans with their own families and life issues to deal with too. I appreciate and will continue to work with our district partners to facilitate and encourage those difficult conversations with unity and transparency to further educators' hard work for the students of Riverside Unified School District. I wish all a wonderful and invigorating summer, enjoy your friends and family, and I look forward to the 2023-2024 year school year. Thank you for your leadership, Ms. Bowling. We have one public comment, uh, Roy Blecker, regarding this item. Is he here in the room? Okay. Okay, we're going to proceed to the next report and we, we can circle back if, 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 he's, if he's called in here. Uh, our next report is uh, uh, given by Ms. Carrie Brown, uh, Vice President of... We're, we'll, we'll just go ahead and... Is, is that okay? We'll just do the public comment. Welcome, Mr. Blackard. You have three minutes. Let him get the three. Hold on so they get your timer up. There you go. I have a few answers I'd like to the comments, or maybe the teachers, the Teachers Association can answer these comments. I was at a town hall meeting Tuesday about the violence at King High School. There was a teacher there who went through RUSD, K through 12. It's taught 20 years. She said this was the first year she didn't feel safe in RUSD schools. She's actually, and this is on videotape, you can check it out. She said she's even thinking of pulling her kids out of these schools. RUSD. Now that was a lot of platitudes we heard in the last couple of minutes. But there was no Pacifics. I think this community in here, standing outside, hundreds strong, overflow crowds into your room, have some concerns about what's going on, and we're not hearing them addressed. 
We're not hearing them address it to teachers. Teachers, I'm all about cooperation. You want cooperation? I got a radio show. Come on in. We'll debate this and talk about it till the cows come home. You want to get these issues out? What's going on? And let's tell the truth. Let's not keep tap dancing around everything that's going on in this, not only in this school district, everywhere. And it will not get fixed if we're just saying, well, this and excuse that and maybe this and stand in my shoes. We all got shoes. We've all walked in this world, earth. We all got a vested interest in it. We got a vested interest in most of this stuff. You know what our most, most precious investment is? Is our kids. Everything stops there. I don't think there's a person in this room that wouldn't do anything for their child. Yet, you hear paralyzed in fear. You see two board members that were invited to come and talk to the parents and would not show. Where were the other teachers strong? Where are they here? Are we going to hear from them today or in the future? And let's come to some solutions of this so we're not having these problems, so we're not having these discussions, so we don't have to come in here and explain why two out of three kids are not at grade level at RUSD. That's what needs to be addressed. That's what should be the topics that are on the table. That's what we're not discussing, and maybe that is the problem, and it starts right here. I um, would like to welcome Ms. Carrie Brown, Vice President of the Certificate Membership for the Riverside Association of School Managers. She'll be providing a report today in the absence of, our, of their president. Welcome, Ms. Brown. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, Board and Cabinet members. My name is Carrie Brown and I'm representing RASM tonight as Vice President of Certificated Membership. Thank you for allowing me a few moments to share an update on the activities of our management association. We are proud, oh, I would like to open by congratulating all of the 2023 graduates. We are proud of your accomplishments. Graduating high school is no small thing, and we are excited for you and your families. In that same thread, I would like to recognize our scholarship recipients. Razum gives out scholarships every year. Starting with, be, oh, we give these to current high school students and also current college students that apply. Bianca Cisneros, currently attending Cal Baptist University, a past Ramona High School student, majoring in elementary education. Uh, Emily Rodriguez, another Ramona High School student, planning to attend the University of California, Irvine, majoring in sports medicine. Melanie Magana, a Poly High School student, planning to attend the University of California, Irvine, or UCR, major in English with the goal of becoming an interpreter and a translator. Brayden Rosa, a current Martin Luther King High School student, planning to attend Cal Baptist University, uh, major in applied theology with the goal of becoming a pastor. Zaina Taylor, a current student at Brigham Young U University with the goal of studying neuroscience and med medical school. She is a past Martin Luther King High School student. And finally, Savannah Zavala, current student at CSU San Bernardino, majoring in psychology, uh, with the goal of becoming a counselor, and she's a former student of John W. North High School. Uh, we have, uh, we, RASM will be holding the end of the year social event on May 31st. We will be hearing from our guest speaker, Julie Smith. She's a media literacy expert, author, and professor. She will be speaking on the impact of social media and the importance of digital, digital literacy in our schools. Included in this event is the recognition of the managers of the year, our retirees, and of course, our RASM scholarship recipients. We encourage all managers, and you are all invited also to attend and join us in celebrating a successful school year. As I close tonight, I wanted to take a moment to thank Assistant Superintendent Dan Sosa for his leadership in RASM over the past two years. He has led our organization through many changes and adjustments, and we appreciate his service to the leaders in RUSD. We also wanted to recognize our incoming executive board for the 23-24 school year. Starting with Clarissa Brown, who will be our president. Today is her birthday. <laughs> That's why she's not here. 
um, past president, Dan Sosa, myself as vice president of certificated membership, David Marshall, who is vice president of classified membership, uh, Stephen Dunlap, vice president of legislative action, Haley Calhoun will be our secretary, Rosalba Rodriguez will be our treasurer, Leanne Iconi is vice president of programs, David Waldrum will be in charge of communication and be our media liaison, and Rochelle Kanatsar is our equity chair. We look forward to continuing to provide support, learning, and opportunities for connection to all the managers in RUSD. Thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership, Ms. Brown, and that report. I'll turn it over now to our superintendent, for uh, uh, Superintendent Hill, for her comments. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. <clears throat> Since our last meeting, I did my last two school visits for the year at uh, John Adams Elementary School and Miller Middle School, where I saw outstanding examples of students collaborating and uh, working to the, to the last days. I also had the pleasure of attending our uh, dual language immersion program, first graduating class celebration. These students started at Washington Elementary in 2010. Uh, and now are graduating uh, po from Poly High School next week. It's a, such an exciting time in our district with the graduation ceremony starting tomorrow and continuing through uh, next week. And I want to congratulate our high school graduates for finishing strong. I send you all my best as you enter the workforce or pursue higher education. I know that the education you received at RUSD has equipped you to be world ready. We educate approximately 40,000 students and feel an immense amount of joy to know that our students are receiving top level education and resources. I take a moment now to reiterate a message that I sent last week. In recent days, the governance team here of the district have answered many questions, heard many public comments, and have been made aware of social media posts following a fight that happened at one of our high schools, Kingheim. Related to that, one of our local legislators did call for a town hall last Tuesday, and a town hall is a very fitting way for a legislator to listen to community members because the state legislature enacts laws that govern the state, and a town hall is an excellent way to hear about those issues that shape the legislative agenda. The Board of Education upholds those federal and state laws that govern California education bodies. And as such, we do not have the authority to make or adopt those policies, any policies that conflict with the laws of the California legislature. So our governance team did not attend the town hall. In the course of our work, however, it is extremely important for us to hear from our constituents too. So please be assured that every message you send is listened to and every email you send is read. Our constituents have an opportunity to join our meetings, which are held once or twice per month, and have the flexibility to submit an e-comment up to one day ahead of board meetings. Members of the public can provide input on any concerns within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. We have spent a considerable amount of time in the last weeks listening even more, I would say. We have been reminded <clears throat> in this very room that the statement was made that we have a desire for all of us to work collaboratively towards solutions that keep each and every student safe on our campuses. We have diverse schools and are responsible to embrace every single child and all the assets they bring to campus. So for that reason, I'll take a little departure. Um, and I heard Mrs. Bowling uh, have a suggestion, so I appreciate that suggestion. I'm happy to um, search it um, or implement it, thank you, <laughs> implement it, try it out. Um, we, we will also be piloting an effort starting with King High School to host small working groups focused on positive student behavior to look at the challenges and map out some solutions. In this way, I think, we think we can achieve our common goal of having safe and supportive schools. Lastly, I want to emphasize our practice of see something, hear something, say something. Please discuss with your student that if they hear something or see something concerning, they should immediately report it to their teacher, administration, or another adult. We have a wee tip line and that information can be found on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. 
Uh, we will now, at this time, members of the public may provide comments on any matters, items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. The board is limited to responses that, that they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet they are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to a presenter's public comments. Also, Oh, my apologies. I, I thought these were general public comments. Okay, we actually do have public comments regarding the last item. Uh, the first one is from L Roy Blecker. Welcome, Mr. Blecker, and then followed by Sandy Arb. If we could please put the... Thank you. It was a very interesting report from the superintendent. She said she heard us. How can you hear somebody when you're not there? The arrogance of this executive staff and these board members are not showing up at that meeting and using the cockamamie excuses I just heard of the legislature. You know what? You may be getting a civics lesson. I invite everybody to stay till the end of this. There are people out here who've had a little bit of experience of working with the government and this, and public speaking, and doing, actually doing things in this community to move it forward, we ain't getting paid for it. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. We don't get a title, we actually make things move. Just like that. That is the biggest cop out. The legislature, you know what you have the ability to do? Is lobby that legislature with the lobbyists you hire, with the money you take from us at the point of a gun. Yeah, how do you get your tax money if it isn't by the force of the firearm, Mr. Hunt? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about now. That is, and you get, that's what you get. These people right here and across from me, they probably know, but they try to snow each and every one of you out here every day. That's why we're here. That's why we're in that. That's why you see the latest report in the Wall Street Journal. Kids are now have a less life expectancy because of what the torture we put them through with COVID and the lockdowns and making them crazy with all the stuff we're doing. Oh yeah, I think a few of us are a little bit concerned. I know some that are not. Because if you were, you would be doing that. We wouldn't have to. That's why we elected you. You are our representatives to be taking care of the education and safety of our children. And I submit to you, and I think the vast majority of the public, and I think the evidence shows you are failing miserably at that endeavor. That has got to change. That will change. Because we're not going to let you destroy the future of our kids. Because that is just totally 100% off the table. Okay, our next speaker is Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. So I've been coming to your meetings now for three years, and I've asked numerous times, can I speak after the superintendent? Can I speak after board member comments? Can I speak after Ms. Bowling and the union comments? And I've always been told, no, you can't. But I've realized one thing in coming to these meetings for three years, and that's the fact that you guys don't know what can and can't be done. So I'm just going to start researching it myself. Because last meeting, you guys were the perfect example of what shouldn't have been done. You, I heard Dr. Noemi said, let's just do what we've always done with restricting comments and, and reducing the time when you try to immediately shut us down to 20 minutes. Well, I went back and looked at some of your meetings, you know, because I don't like to watch TV. So I watch your board meetings over. Very enlightening. So I watched them again. And, you know, when you had the, the Native Americans here complaining about Candace Reed, and there were parents complaining about masks, you cut us all down to two minutes. 
um, when we've had um, the union workers came down here, you should cut us all down to two minutes. How but is this yet, related to superintendent? Superintendent comments? comments about what she said about hearing us. Okay, so last meeting, you guys cut us back selectively. You let the Castleview parents speak. You let all of them be heard, but yet you cut us down to two minutes. Anybody that you assumed was speaking about King. And when I say assumed, because my speaker card said public comment. So I would love to know who's psychic up here to know that I was gonna speak about King, that um, attorney Letitia Peppers, who was here last meeting, was gonna speak about King, or even the gentleman from Mountain View that was speaking about equity. He got lumped in too. See, I requested all the speaker cards from last meeting, and I saw what you guys did, and I heard Mr. Hunt tell you, you needed a certain amount to be able to cut us down. To, to lock us down to 20 minutes. So that's not wanting to hear us. So when you wanna make statements and say, we hear you, we're listening, this board is not hearing us. This board is not listening. And you, have to, you cannot censor speech or you know, reduce speech based on content. That's illegal. That's why we have a First Amendment. So that was completely inappropriate and I am filing a complaint. And I can't wait to see how you handle public comment tonight because I wanna see if you're gonna reduce reach or reduce the teachers or who are you gonna to reduce tonight because it better be fair. Because if not, I will gladly add it to my complaint to Mike Hestron. Um, and again, that first meeting, we came April 6th. We told you April 6th what was going on. You ignored us. Ms. Briscoe went ahead and defended the student for three minutes, um, basically implied that, you know, his rights trump religious freedoms to, to disagree with his lifestyle, not realizing that religion and your thoughts are your basic human rights. Um, so hopefully they teach you that at Berkeley. Um, but again, that was completely inappropriate. You didn't want to hear us. You only heard us because it went viral and then you still didn't show up to face your constituents and you won't even look at me now, Dr. Hernandez. Have a nice evening. At this time, members of the public may provide comments on any items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. The board is limited to responses they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet they are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to a presenter's public comments. Also, I'd like to note that public comments submitted via the electronic communication submission form for this meeting have been provided to the board and have also been attached to the agenda for this meeting. Uh, Trustee Hunt just provided me the comment cards, and so we will begin with Kim Ebby. Or Eby. Kim Eby. Followed by Janice Ramirez, followed by Connie Rice Nicholson. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. If we could put the timer up, please. Thank you. Good evening. I am here to advocate for all RUSD students and staff. I am gravely concerned about the extreme behaviors that we are seeing across the district. I've been a teacher in the district for 17 years. And recently, I have seen an increase in the amount of disruptive and, to be honest, disturbing behaviors in our student population and an utter lack of consequences. As an educator and a mom of four RUSD students, I am outraged at the amount of defiance, disrespect, and outright abusive behaviors that our students are displaying. I am concerned for the mental well-being of students and teachers who are witnessing these extreme behaviors. Teachers are being physically assaulted, students screaming and cursing in class, students damaging school properties in fits of rage, students eloping, forcing schools to lock in, students threatening rape, students threatening gun violence upon our schools. The list goes on. I am concerned for the emotional damage this is causing students who bear witness to these alarming acts, as well as my fellow colleagues who have to deal with these unsafe and fundamentally wrong behaviors daily. How can anyone teach or learn in this type of environment? My high schoolers have told me several times this year that they do not want to attend pep rallies because there have been threats made. How can I help calm their nerves when I agree that they are unsafe to attend when students making threats are allowed back into our schools? I ask you, what is the district doing with our concerns? Every RUS teacher that I have spoken with is frustrated with the lack of disciplinary action or follow through. I've been told for years that we are developing a plan. What are we doing to support students and staff being terrorized by these extreme behaviors now? Teachers are reporting behaviors to the chain of command for students to return with little or no consequence. A teacher was being physically assaulted by a student and when she brought the complaint to admin, she was told that the district could provide her with protective gloves for her to wear while she was working with this student. 
This is just one example. We have been told to use PBIS, MTSS, positive reinforcement, praise, tangible objects to reward students for the most basic expectations, like sitting and listening to the teacher, not eloping, raising your hand, etc. Kids are offered so many prizes that I fear that they are no longer intrinsically motivated. I feel that we as educators are discouraged from giving consequences. I have been told that we cannot confiscate property when it has sexually explicit words written on it. Every year I have PGS teachers sent through my room to observe successful classroom management. I pride myself on building a class community founded in mutual respect. My students know that I love and care about them. My number one job is to keep them safe, just like I provide a loving home for my four children. Boundaries are in place to foster a feeling of safety. Chaos suits no one. What are we doing now? Our next speaker is Janice Ramirez, followed by Connie Rice Nicholson. Is Janice Ramirez here? Welcome, Janice. You have three minutes. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Hill. My name is Janice Ramirez, and I'm here as an RUSD teacher to express my deep concerns about the current state of discipline within our school district. The lack of discipline has resulted in a culture where both students and teachers are being exposed to unnecessary risks. Even our youngest students understand that there are little to no consequences in our schools. Oftentimes, they can see that these negative behaviors are being rewarded as students return to class with a toy or candy given by administrators. There have been multiple instances of physical harm among students which have not been effectively addressed. Students have been hit in the head by desks, chairs, books, and more that were thrown. These altercations, among others, not only endanger the well-being of those involved, but also create a hostile and unsafe environment for other students and teachers. We are normalizing violence in the classroom. Personally, this year I've been hit, kicked, bit, scratched, and had furniture pushed on me by student. I've also been instructed to use furniture to block a student from eloping out of my classroom. And unfortunately, I'm not the only teacher in this position. In my class, we were subjected to a student pounding on our door and glass yelling, let me the F in, and he didn't use the letter. For over 40 minutes, he escalated, throwing his shoes at the glass and continued cursing and banging on the door with the administrator and SAP counselor being unsuccessful at calming him down. No consequences were given, and the student returned the next day. After this incident, one student left RESD due to anxiety and was homeschooled. Numerous reports from teachers indicate a growing trend of disruptive behavior in classrooms. I ask you to consider how innocent children are supposed to thrive in such a volatile environment. The equity of all students is compromised by the behavior of a few. Placing a certificated substitute as a one-on-one -on -one babysitter an enormous waste of financial resources and a disservice to the student crying out for help. Some possible solutions include strengthening disciplinary procedures and making this policy readily available for teachers and parents. Is safety for all more important than an API score on a dashboard? Discipline should not be avoided to make a school appear better. Virtual school, number two, virtual school is a requirement for students whose behavior has escalated through all other disciplinary procedures. Three, a fast track system for severe behavior needs and take, this has taken me over six months to get help for my two extreme students and those resources were still not effective. Four, counselors and teachers trained in severe trauma at each school site. Five, full-time aides for all kindergarten classrooms like Moreno Valley Unified has done. Our students deserve the opportunity to thrive in an environment free from fear and trauma. I can assure you if your child or grandchild were in my classroom, you would remove them. With the lack of safety, we have chosen to pay for our grandson's tuition in private school to avoid the severe negative behaviors that he would be exposed to in an RUST school, and this makes me sad. I request that the school board take swift and decisive action on the concerns raised here tonight. Thank you, Janice. Our next speakers are Connie Rice Nicholson, followed by Rocio Mejia, followed by Stacy Ritter. Welcome, Connie. You have three minutes. Good evening, everybody here tonight, including all of our teachers in the overflow room. My name is Connie Rice Nicholson, and I'm speaking to you tonight as a member of our RUSD family. Some of you on this board know my father. He retired after teaching at Gage and Polly for 37 years. My stepmom taught for 26 years at Gage. As for me, this is my 30th year teaching 
in RUSD. My family has given this district almost 100 years of service. Think about that for a minute, 100 years. I'm here tonight because I want you to see my face and hear directly from me how I am feeling. I have spent most of my adult life as a teacher in our district. I've held many leadership roles and been a mentor teacher. I'm aware of what it takes to have good classroom management, but I'm here to tell you, that world that I once taught in is gone. I now work in a war zone. I spend all of my days dealing with discipline issues. I go home every day exhausted and overwhelmed and feeling like a failure. I have three more years before I retire, but every single morning, I have to force myself to go to work. My family is watching me suffer and they worry about me. They worry for my safety and for my mental and physical health, and I'm still trying to decide if I will even come back next year. This is simply no way to live. So what am I asking from you? I'd like you for a moment to just visualize your family, your loved ones, put their picture in your mind, visualize your spouse, your sibling, your child. If one of your family members was experiencing daily ongoing trauma, experiencing the disturbing events mentioned here tonight, would you let them and tell them that they would need to wait months for help? Would you tell them there's nothing you can do? You keep saying we are part of your RUSD family, but are we really? Tonight you have heard some of the most disturbing behaviors happening in our schools and you've heard from parents, students, teachers who are scared to go to school because they're not safe. Is this how we treat our family? What if these incidents involved your loved ones? What would you do to help? Teachers have been asking for clarification about our district's discipline policies, but no meaningful answers have been provided. Apparently we have no policy. It's left to the discretion of each school administrator. You keep deflecting to the state of California and we are sick and tired of hearing this as your excuse to do nothing. It is time to stand up for your RUSD family and put together a plan to address these serious discipline issues. It is time for you to value our students and teachers more than your scores on that school dashboard. It is time for you to create a unified district discipline plan and it is time to stop with the excuses. There is no more time to wait. This is a health and safety crisis. And if nothing is done about it, the consequences are gonna be on your hands. If we are truly your family, then act like it. Hear us, really hear us. Protect us, stand up for us. Don't just say we're your family. Show us that you really are, that we are. Thank you, Connie. Our next speakers are Rochelle Mejia, followed by Stacy Ritter, followed by uh, Ro Ray Blackard. Blackard. Is uh, Rocio here? Welcome, Rocio. You have three minutes. My name is Rocio Mejia. That's why. Okay. Hi, Mr. Hunt. Uh, hi, Ms. Hill. I actually came last time and I presented to you the fact that my child is um, one of the kids that has been spit on, kicked, um, punched several times. I want to ask you what this is going to do to her future and how she's going to feel about. I'm sorry. One second. The okay. Please proceed. Sorry. The timer wasn't showing. About showing up on the next day of school. Because in two years, my daughter has changed um, in her ability to feel confident in herself. Like, I just want to know and tell you that it has a psychological effect on my, my five-year-old. As a matter of fact, um, I want to explain to you that I've always been very supportive of my teacher. But because of this issue, it's, I'm not blaming my teacher. I'm blaming you guys because we were actually told that you haven't heard teachers complain. Here they are and I thank you very much for coming today because last time we, we, need, to, we need to hear this. We need to be transparent and I'm here representing my, my daughter once again. I said, what am I going to say to them? I'm going to tell you that at the end of the day, I'm a parent and I hate to see how my child comes home crying about something that is completely out of my teacher's hand. It's completely out of my hand because I'm not there. I'm not there and I can't be there. So in, in, with all this said, I, I want to let you know that it affects the ability that a, um, that, a, that a parent should have the communication with the teacher 
But it's very confusing because I'm trying to protect my daughter. I have a wonderful teacher, and and my daughter, uh, my daughter loves her teacher, but she's kind of confused of the behavior that she's seen in the classroom. So um, I don't think that she's reached her her ability, like her capability. And I think she's a very smart little girl. So um, it does affect them educationally wise. I, I don't think you guys realize how much. And I think you guys really need to get out there and, and watch the effect that it really has. Um, child punching more than two kids, like, how, come on guys, how many times does it take? How many punches does it take to go down? Like, that's not okay. Um, are these being documented? Are uh, those are the questions that I ask? Are the, is every every thing that happens being documented properly? Because um, I didn't know my daughter got punched. My daughter tells me she got punched, so I'm not okay with that. But anyways, I just want to um, say thank you to Sonia Shaw, who was a board member who attended from Chino Hills. She was an amazing representative to what what should be done and to Bill Saley for actually going and letting us know that it was okay to come and speak on our behalf. Um, education does become, education does start at home and, but we are asking. Thank, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Our next speakers are Stacy Ritter followed by Roy Blackheart, followed by Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. Ritter. You have three minutes. Good evening. As you are all, all aware, Assemblyman Bill Asaley requested Dr. Hernandez Alexander and Tom Hunt's presence at this week's town hall to talk with parents regarding the ongoing violence in our schools and teachers. Your letter in return, not giving any reason to an assemblyman and parents, speaks volumes in how low you pursue, perceive parents and how out of touch you truly are with this community. I find it odd that after the summer of 2020, and in particular, Mr. Hunt spouts, talk to the state, talk to legislators, we don't make the laws, we have to follow them. And yet, almost three years later, there's a real live human legislator coming to our city to do just that, and you had empty seats. I want to review a few of the legislations for the public so they know what's coming down the pike. Um, AB 274 by Senator Nancy Skinner. Uh, it's regarding suspensions and expulsions. This bill would remove suspension and expulsions of any willful defiance of valid authority. Every single teacher and student will be affected by this. Their hands are already tied by so much red tape and you staff in the unions are doing nothing to fight these bad bills. Why not? Assembly Bill uh, 599 by Chris Ward. This will remove suspension and expulsions for students in possession of tobacco, snuff, chew, vaping products, etc. This is just another bill giving children more authority to do as they please. Children need strict guidelines and rules, and this cannot fare well for the district if this passes. AB 665 by Scott Weiner and, and Wendy Carrillo. This bill removes the requirement of why the 12 and older child can go get counseling. So now it can be for anything. It can be for abortion, it can be for gender affirming care, and let me be clear, it removes parents' consent and knowledge altogether. Why don't you guys have some kind of task force fighting these bad bills that inherently ruin our district? Corey Jackson's AB 1299, this bill, bill removes school district's ability to use their funds for any school resource officers. So that would mean zero police at your children's schools because you would need to find new funds for that and where are you gonna get those from? So probably you'll cut police off campuses altogether. Um, the reason I bring up these is to educate the public, but to remind the board, especially Tom Hunt, who on at least two occasions, I publicly asked for an update if he sent video clips from all the parents who came out that summer and fall of 2020, like he said he was going to do. But we know that was never done. No one advocates for the parents. I don't expect you to go you know, to the uh, town hall and make laws. I know you don't make laws, but you can see what your constituents want and fight for it. Have another task force. You have a zillion committees. I mean, you can't add one more and learn and like fight for the parents. And that's, it's, it's silence and it, that you're not doing anything for us. It's just, it's disheartening. It, thank you. Thank you. Our next speakers are Roy Blechard, followed by Sandy R, followed by Shannon Trent. Welcome, Mr. Blechard. You have three minutes. Last week, you saw students 
you saw parents, you saw teachers come up here and want, want answers on King and the violence and everything is coming on. You've seen teachers come up here today. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Tell you exactly what's going on in the school today. The absolute hellhole they have become. They become that under your watch. No further example than last week's or last board meeting you had when this issue came up. Well, Hunt and Alexander had a couple comments, but the gutless wonders Farouk, Kinnear, and Brent Lee didn't even have a comment. Why isn't it on the freaking agenda today? You guys should be here every damn day at a study session or a board meeting straightening this out. How bad does it got to get from here? Do we got to have kids dead in the street before you guys will act? This is as more serious than a heart attack. Yet you sit there paralyzed in fear that you might lose your position or you might lose your job. That is what the problem is. You heard the teachers present, oh yeah, we might have some problems with all the flowery stuff and everything's going great. Most of the time, the teachers that did have, and I applaud them that come up with the guts to say this, because you know the intimidation factors, the threats that come on when, when employees of the public employees come up here and tell the truth. That is flat, 100%. We are living in some of the most tumultuous times. Yet I know you're talented enough and you know what should be done. You just don't have the willpower. You don't have the guts. You don't have the caring to do what's right. Because if you did, we wouldn't be sitting here all today. Maybe this has got your attention. I hope so. We shall see. But if it isn't, all the throngs you see out here will get 10 times bigger. And then it will be 10 times bigger than that. Because we're not going to stop until this stuff is fixed, our kids are safe, and our kids are getting the education they deserve. Okay, thank you. We have overall eight cards left on different topics. Uh, the next speakers are Sandy R., followed by Shannon Trent, followed by Joshua Bell. Welcome, Ms. R., you have three minutes. Okay, so I want to start by asking, do any of you know me personally? Do you socialize with me? No, right? You don't. A simple nod can confirm that, but you won't even look at me. The fact is you don't know me. Yet you've made a lot of assumptions about me based on these meetings that you claim to know my deeply held beliefs. You also do not understand gender fluidity and what it means to be gender fluid. So I will enlighten you. According to dictionary.com, gender fluid is defined as noting or relating to a person whose gender identity or gender expression is not fixed and shifts over time or changes depending on situation. So. I have been gender fluid my entire life and I didn't even know it because it wasn't something that we used to define ourselves by. I was always a tomboy. I have always felt more masculine or feminine at different times, but it was just a feeling, so not something that truly impacted my day-to-day -day life. When I'm watching football, I'm feeling masculine. When I'm baking, I'm feeling feminine. When I'm at these school board meetings, I feel masculine. I thought nothing of using the men's restroom at the last board meeting since I was feeling masculine at the time, and your policy allows for this, and so does the state. Gender fluidity does not require gender expression. It is just a feeling. I asserted my gender fluidity before entering, and yet I am being harassed. You mailed me a cease and desist letter from an attorney claiming that I was attempting to cause distress to your employees. A 5'6", fully dressed female causing an adult male employee distress. While you allow a 6 foot plus male into the female locker room to expose himself to the female students. That's not distressing? 
Your lawyer then went on to assume that I am female. How does she know this? Is she judging me by my long hair or my ultra feminine attire? That is gender expression and it is not required for gender fluidity. I want, if you want to play this woke game, then you better learn the terms because you're pushing policies that you don't even have a clue what they mean. Your own policy defines these terms and the district's action and yet you violated them. So I'm gonna read some excerpts from your policy. If I run out of time, I'll do it after your board member comments. A non-binary student means a student whose gender identity falls outside of the traditional conception of strictly either female or male, regardless of whether or not the student identifies as transgender, was born with intersex traits, uses gender neutral pronouns, uses agender, genderqueer, pangender, or any other non-conforming gender variant or such other more specific term to describe their gender. That's from your policy. So it doesn't sound very specific to me for your attorney to presume to know what I am or how I'm feeling. So I don't Thank think I'm going to rest. I'll finish it next time. Comments. Our next speakers are Shannon Trent, followed by Joshua Bell, followed by Tisha Wheeler. Welcome, Ms. Trent. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Hill and members of the board. Um, thank you for your time in hearing out some of my concerns today. I come to you today as both a concerned educator and a parent. This year has been a very interesting year, to say the least. In my classroom, I have had a student who has needed a lot of support. This student would climb on classroom furniture, throw items across the room and towards other students and myself, pull over desks, run out of the classroom, yell and scream, act out towards other students, and not do much work at all during the day. While I feel I had a lot of support from my administration and I was grateful for this, it caused a lot of disturbance in our classroom. I was in tears many days just trying to figure out what I could do for this child, but also for the other students in my class. I felt like they were not receiving the education that they deserved due to this one student. And while I understood that this student has rights, I started to wonder, who's gonna stand up for the rights of all the other children in my classroom? I was the only one who really knew what it was like, and while I was sure my students would tell their parents about these issues, I know many things did not get conveyed to parents because I teach five-year-olds. I began to think what I want my own child in this classroom. Honestly, no. And that broke my heart. I've been an educator for 20 years. I've been loved my job very much. I love what I do even now, but some days I don't want to come to work. And this is a horrible feeling. I have a 14-year-old son who attended the elementary school I work at, but I thought, would I want my four-year-old to attend here? Probably not. Things have changed so much since my first son was in elementary school. Sadly, when I began reaching out for support and guidance, I began hearing that this type of situation is the norm. And it's happening all over the district. This combined with the incidents that are happening at King High School where my son is supposed to attend next year has me worried as a parent to feel confident to send my son to a school that I thought was supposed to be so amazing. We bought our house where we did in part for the school system. And now elementary to high school are sounding like they're all suffering from these issues. While I understand the education sh system is shifting, I hope the board will consider that students also need discipline and consequences, and teachers like me need support. If we continue to show them that there are no consequences for their actions, then our classrooms will continue to look like this. And while I'm a part of the MTSS group on campus and believe it has a lot of good qualities, we also have to stop and ask the question, what do we do for those students who do not respond to MTSS? What are we gonna do to help them? I and others I've talked to are seriously considered enrolling our kids in private school, and that makes me sad because I went here to RUSD. Thank you, Shannon. Our next speakers are Joshua Bell, followed by Tisha Wheeler, followed by Lori Lopez. Welcome, Joshua. You have three minutes. This is the most intimidating thing because I'm on the other side of this. I'm the proud papa of four children. I'm here tonight to speak about my experiments, experience with the Lake Matthews Elementary School staff and administration in regards to discipline specifically. I have, my, I have two of my children enrolled at LME. 
Tonight I'm going to speak to the experience of my son Aiden. Aiden was born with the cards stacked against, of life stacked against him. In 2021, Aiden was enrolled into kindergarten where we were blessed to have Danny Ippolito as his kindergarten teacher. While Ms. Ippolito was not provided the training to handle behaviors that Aiden had, she was willing to jump in and learn to partner with us. It was a rough school year, as I am sure anyone would attest to. I was naive and wanted to be that supportive parent. So when the first suspension came on, uh, on 8, 9, yes, the second day of school, I willingly took Aiden home and started working, on, working with the suspension. From there, Aiden was suspended uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 days. In kindergarten, Mr. Spudick found it appropriate to suspend the kindergarten 10 days. First grade, we have been suspended a total of seven days, including an in-wolf suspension by Miss Wolf. The beginning of the year was great. We had Miss Conrad, and we were able to have great days. However, due to additional kindergarten class being needed, Mr. Spudick decided to dissolve this class where he was thriving. My son has been targeted by several of the LME staff, but primarily led by Ms. Spudick. My son was placed with an untrained aide in kindergarten who ultimately ended up assaulting my son earlier this year. I was asked to come in and meet with the principal and team because Aiden bit his aide, only to find out that the aide wasn't bit. In fact, aide triggered Aiden by pulling on his clothing and pulling on his arms because he was trying to give the lunch lady a hug. Then he was written up by Ms. Torres and sent to Master Spudic's office for a month or office a month or so later for demonstrating the same behaviors that were done to him by an adult staff member. He was referred to the office for accidentally stepping on a little girl's hands and other offenses similar. It was clear that Ms. Torres was not a good fit, so I requested a change of teacher at that time. However, as all employees do, there was, there was talk about the difficult student that Aiden was. He was placed in Ms. Wolf's class where there was already a stigma about him. At first, it felt as though we would be a good fit. However, after time, it quickly became clear that she did not want him there. I'll jump to the end. We do have advocates at the school. Miss James, Miss Lisa Brown, Miss Carmel, and Miss Ashley at the front desk were the people that we felt we had in the corner. We need to offer these teachers training. We need to offer the staff training. I feel like there's teachers coming up here saying, oh, get rid of the difficult students. That's not the solution. These kids have things stacked against them from the very beginning of life, and they need support from these people the most. Stop. Thank you, Joshua. Our next speakers are Artisha Wheeler, followed by Lori Lopez, followed by Summer Davis. Is Ms. Wheeler here? Welcome, Ms. Wheeler. You have three minutes. Good evening, esteemed board members and Superintendent Hill. My name is Artisa Wheeler, and I'm here on a topic of discipline and extreme behaviors that are an epidemic in itself district-wide. I know this topic of conversation is not new, so I pray you become fully aware of these transgressions. I'm going to paint a picture of actual events that took place in my colleague's class as she is not able to be here to try to bridge the gap in knowledge to the point of action. The best teachers are quick on their toes, pivoting from one hic hiccup in a lesson to a modified lesson and making connections, when all of a sudden a desk gets flipped over. Before you can intervene, books, pencils, and manipulatives are flying across the room. The students get up and begin throwing chairs and anything else she can get her hands on. Students are grasping their ears to brace themselves from the loud banging of items that are being recklessly thrown. The teacher radios for support and begins to evacuate the classroom. About 15 minutes of chaos transpire inside. Uh, the student has been evacuated and the rest of the class can safely return to the room. Everything is in disarray. The teacher's heart is racing all the while she tries to pick up where they left off and proceed with little focus on the trauma that everyone just endured. Students are in fear and trying not to let it show. The exited student is running around the building, banging on the doors, screaming to let her back in. This proceeds for what feels like an eternity. Eventually, the student returns to class and everyone is on edge as no one knows when the chaos will be inflicted again. These events were happening multiple times a day and after a behavior analysis, it was determined that she threw an average of 14 items a day. Imagine while someone was standing here trying to speak, such as myself, all the while someone else is throwing books, tables, chairs, shoes, and anything they can get their hands on. Could you really focus or hear the words that are coming out of my mouth, not to mention to learn a new concept or skill? I could almost guarantee that your heart would elevate, your eyes would begin to drift, and your attention is now 100% on flight or fight. 
Now also imagine your child is in my class. You entrust the school and the district to give your child a safe learning environment and to set the foundation for their educational journey. Your child comes home and shares with you these events. You try to believe the school and teacher are doing everything they can to support the situation, when in reality the school has sent a different certificated sub to support each day. The sub is unequivocally unqualified to handle severe behaviors and a babysitter at best. It took nine months to properly qualify the student and complete a change of placement for an emotional disturbance. Teachers are in an abusive relationships with the district who is taking a blind eye to the trauma they are exposed to. The district states that it values community, engagement, equity, excellence, and well-being. So today, teachers are standing before you, imploring you to act on these values. Stop sitting on your hands and take action. You can no longer avoid the conversation. Classrooms are not safe. Learning is not equitable. The well-being of students and faculty is at risk. And above all, this is not excellence. This is the reality of what we are facing that demands attention before someone gets seriously injured and we end up on the national news. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wheeler. We have four public comments left. Lori Lopez, followed by Summer Davis, followed by Amy Sisko, closed by Aaron Massey. Welcome, Ms. Lopez. Hi, um, I would like just to start by saying that it's extremely disappointing that members of the board did not feel it important to show up to the town hall that Assemblyman um, Billis Daly held on Tuesday night. Reflecting on Ms. the last- Ms. Lopez, my apologies, the, the counter is- I'm time. not gonna take the whole time, so. Um, it was bothersome to me that, um, well, reflecting on the last meeting, um, it was shocking to me that only, um, One trustee acknowledged the parents' concerns that night, and that was Dr. Alexander Hernandez Alexander. And so I wanted to um, acknowledge you and thank you for that. Um, it was bothersome to me that further in the meeting, um, during the last meeting, um, I brought up the, the issue of the state and the, <clears throat> the uh, laws and things that you all have to follow. And I explained that I think you do a poor job of educating parents. Um, when a board member, um, directed staff, I believe it was Mr. Walker, um, his comment was, well, parents can look up the ed code themselves. Um, this attitude and behavior is not congruent with your social media or statements that you make on this dais that as a district you want and value parent involvement because it seems that you only respond to parents who praise and agree with you. I will continue to advocate that this board direct staff to present data as I've asked for. I think parents have a right to know the numbers so that we can see if these positive behavior programs, increase in mental health professionals, this mysterious MTSS program, are having a positive impact in reducing issues at school that lead to violence. I would also like to know numbers on campus supervisors, security personnel at King Daily, and this increase that was spoke about last meeting. When concerned parents voice concerns at school board meetings, their response needs to be less what we can't do, and more, what we can do. Because as we learned on Tuesday night at the town hall, your hands are not tied as tight as you want to make us believe. So we would like to hear more from you, more action about what you're doing with regards to these problems that have been talked about tonight, of school discipline, of school violence, and a lot less of acting like we're the problem. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Our last three speakers are Summer Davis, followed by Amy Sisko, followed by Aaron Massey. Welcome, Ms. Davis. You have three minutes. Okay, um, I have three kids in the school district. I have five, but two of them have graduated. So I have three attending currently. I'm a very concerned parent. Um, the first thing I'd like to speak tonight is about security. With fights happening daily at King High School, it is obvious that there is not enough supervision on campus. Um, with the amount of kids that are attending there, the board members from Chino Hills that attended the town hall meeting that none of you attended um, said that when she, was on the, when she got on the school board, they doubled their security at the school and nearly eliminated violence. So I want to know what are we waiting for here at RUSD? Like, why are we not taking action and getting more security on our campus? Like, this should be happening today. It shouldn't be something that we think about or do next month. This should be happening, like, today. It's not something that can be put off. Um, are we waiting for the next tragedy to happen? The security of our kids is a very serious matter. It needs to be taken more seriously than what is currently going on. We need to put a stop to the violence. 
Um, there's an Instagram account called King High Fights that is an incentive for troublemakers to get their moment of fame. With policies the way they are, teachers and students are afraid to take part in breaking up fights. Students shouldn't have to feel like they need to step in and break fights because somebody else is getting beat on. That is the responsibility of the adults. Our kids have a right to feel safe at school. It is time for security at King, it's time to up the security at King High School. Um, this leads to my next topic, which is discipline. My children have told me that kids can get into a fight on Friday and be back to school on Monday. Like, this is not okay. Um, there needs to be a harsher uh, consequences for kids who engage in intimidation, bullying, and fights. There needs to be zero tolerance. There should be no tolerance for this. Having access to education is a right, but being on campus is a privilege. And if these kids are unable to control themselves and show adults and other students respect, there needs to be consequences. If a student gets into a fight, they shouldn't be on campus the next day or the next week. They can learn remotely until they can learn to show respect and control themselves. Until the students get disciplined, this school is going to be out of control. Our teachers and kids should not feel unsafe at school because they know that if someone decides to pick a fight with them, nobody's coming to help. That's not right. Next, I'd like to discuss the issue of locker room and bathroom assignment. Kids should be required to go into the bathroom or locker room of their biological gender, not gender identity. Last year, my son was required to dress out in front of a biological female. I tried to get help and was told there was nothing that could be done, so I pulled him out and homeschooled him for a year. Why should one kid be allowed to make all the other kids uncomfortable? Maybe a transgender bathroom needs to be discussed. What is happening now isn't working. We will not stand for it, and unless something changes, you are going to start seeing lawsuits from us parents. I have been told by, by all of you several times that these issues are out of your hands, but I know they thank aren't. You, thank you, Ms. Davis. Our next two comments, our final two comments, are Amy Sisko and Aaron Massey. Welcome, Ms. Sisko. You have three minutes. Good evening, board members. I stand before you tonight as a mom, but also in solidarity with these teachers. I just want to ask you guys, when you guys think, do any introspection or get up in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror, just really think about this. Why did you run for a school board? Is it because you truly care about the kids? Much like my mom did, former um, school board member Gail Cloud, she truly did it because she cared about the kids. Or did you guys do it for a higher office, to run for a higher office? Is this a stepping stone? Is this like exciting to have this on your resume? I mean, I get it, it's pretty impressive. But why did you guys run? If you ran to, and because you cared truly about the kids, then you would plead with the teachers unions who have donated huge amounts to all of your campaigns, I think, or mostly all of them. Why don't you plead with the teachers unions to help these teachers and the students? I mean, this is just like ridiculous that they don't feel safe at school. Um, just really quick also, I wanted to get to the fact about the town hall meeting. We're pleading with you guys to listen to us. And then you didn't go to the town hall. You said in an email basically um, that you don't have the authority to make or adopt local policies, so you weren't going to go um, because it would not be, um, it would be misleading to attend, giving the impression that our board has the ability to change local policies governed by state and federal law, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I just was told that you guys are meeting with uh, Sabrina Cervantes. So I'm curious about that. Like if you're not going to meet with, um, is that political? I hope it's not. I hope you guys really care about the kids and don't make your position political or make school safety political or anything else political. And that's it. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Aaron Massey. Macy. Welcome, Ms. Macy. You have three minutes. Good evening, Superintendent Hill and members of the board. I am here in support of my colleagues uh, to speak about elementary school discipline. As a member of our site's MTSS team, I've been helping to shape our school's uh, procedures for behavior. I feel like we've been successful in planning and beginning to implement these protocols. However, the behaviors that my colleagues and I are concerned about are those that are not able to be supported or changed by PBIS. As teachers, we've been criticized for being frustrated or focusing on these students when they're the, the minority. Um, I would explain that the reason that we're focusing on these students and becoming increasingly frustrated is because helping them feels beyond our scope. Um, 
sorry, I strongly believe in community circles, restorative practices, counseling, behavior plans, and teaching students based on their individual need. Um, however, that's not enough. We talk a lot about college and career readiness, but these students are not ready for either when they're not able to engage with their peers and learn in a classroom environment. There are a lot of conversations about rights, and yes, all students have rights. However, it's part of the fabric of our nation that the rights of one cannot infringe upon the rights of all. We need, um, sorry, many of these students that are experiencing these extreme behaviors are not learning or experiencing success in the classroom. Oh, sorry, I said that twice. All right. My husband and I um, both attended private school, and we both said we would never send our kids to private school. Um, but, because uh, I love what I do, and I really believe in it. Um, but seeing how our classrooms are being completely turned upside down by extreme behaviors is a major reason that we enrolled my kindergartner in private school. Um, that way he wouldn't see a lot of these behaviors. I won't repeat them that everybody um, is, is talking about tonight. Um, so an idea that I have would be to expand our SAP behavior. The current program is overstretched and has a waiting list. Uh, we need to have access to this assistance at the beginning of the year. We need aides trained in behavioral therapy because with 27 other students, we're unable to do the intensive rewards and behavior charts needed to make any kind of progress. Um, at many of our sites, we could have used a behavioral aid full time. Uh, that's how many extreme behaviors we have. But instead, our administrators, SAP counselors, MTSS counselors, and campus aides are being used as one-on-ones to support these students. Um, and that's a huge race, waste of resources. And so our teachers and students desperately need more help. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Macy. It's been, this concludes public input. I've been requested uh, by my colleagues to take a five-minute recess. Is that a 10-minute ten ten recess? When we uh, can reconvene, we will have board member comments. Uh, thank you all for your input. We will be back in 10 minutes, 7.25.
we are reconvening our school board meeting now back at 7.30 p.m. If everyone can please take their seats. We will hear now on board member comments and we will start with our fantastic stu student board member, Lauren Briscoe. If you could lead us off, please. So first of all, I would just like to say that um, today was a senior checkout at Ramona High School. And so it's officially my last day. And for all the other seniors, everyone's graduating. Ooh, no. <laughs> And I would also like to um, mention that I was just so impressed at the RUSD sweep at the 25 Most Remarkable Teens for Downtown Riverside. It's a Mayor's Award, um, Senate Awards, California Legislation Awards were given to so many people in RUSD from Ramona, King, North, etc. I know that Ramona made up, I think it was about 30% of the people who got recognized for that. And I just think that's so impressive. And I'm, I'm very proud of everyone who received it. But um, onto topics I would like to address. Um, I have some information from miscellaneous groups and RUSD that are kind of concerned about the following topics. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the sex education courses um, in RUSD. I don't know. I heard a lot from Ramona, so I don't know if this just applies to Ramona, but. What I've kind of heard is um, the process in which that students take sex ed is usually in the first primitive years of high school. And um, it takes place usually during their PE classes. You know, you um, go and you attend your PE class, you attend um, a course within that PE class, which then qualifies for your uh, health course. However, um, as you guys probably already know, there's an array of ways that people can fulfill this. So people don't always have to uh, directly take a PE class. They can get their PE credits through um, a dance class, a sports class, et cetera, marching band. Um, and I've had a lot of students coming to me saying that the material being taught within these classes are not very extremely inclusive. Um, so they kind of focus on, I guess, on topics that they would like to be more expanded on. And um, also what I have heard is that there's students who are in um, the dance classes, marching band, um, et cetera, the different classes that you can take to fulfill this. And they're actually not even receiving that course. Their teachers won't uh, take them. They're, I, I know people now and people have come to me that say they have not actually attended a sex ed class, a health class during high school period. So they were saying that they feel like uh, they're at a disadvantage and I, I can only agree considering that I think a, a health class is extremely important, especially um, growing into a young adult. So uh, with that being said, I was just saying that, you know, maybe the course material should be kind of looked into. Um, seeing why students are not necessarily attending that course should also be looked into. Um, another thing that I would like to address, uh, probably for the last time, uh, just for the sake of clarity, is that um, I, uh, during the last board meeting, spoke on the MLK event, and I would just like to say that um, in no way Am I defending violent behavior? In fact, I believe that every student should be safe in any school that they're attending. There's no violent behavior that could be done and not addressed, period. Um, but what I was trying to address was the fact that there's a lot of inappropriate comments, rude comments that are being, um, that are being, I guess you could say, spoken toward on social media and uh, in person that are very disrespectful just to the student's identity. And I just was encouraging to have empathy and stray away from that, address the issue um, rather than the person's identity. And so, but besides that, the only other thing that I really have to mention is that um, I really emphasize the use of gender neutral bathrooms. To I'm still having a lot of people come to me saying that, uh, um, you know, some people are identifying as 
uh, non-binary or transgender, et cetera, and they go and they use a bathroom in which they identify as um, and are being threatened in the bathrooms, are being harassed in the bathrooms, et cetera. There's um, some people that have very little tolerance, very little acceptance for that. And so I just really emphasize that uh, just for safety concerns. And that's, that's about it. Thank you, Lauren, for your comments. Trustee Brentley. Sorry, there, I didn't hear you. I uh, also want to congratulate uh, Lauren Briscoe on being a fantastic trustee this year. It's been a pleasure sitting next to you and for your recognition as being one of the 25 most remarkable teens in Riverside. I uh, want to also thank everybody for being here this evening. Um, uh, we can sense your passion. We know that this is an issue that's important. Uh, it doesn't fall on deaf ears. Uh, I'm a parent. I've mentioned that many times. I've got three kids that are going to public school. So, of course, safety is important to me, not only as a parent, but as a board member. So it's something that's on the forefront of all of our minds. And it's an issue that we're constantly trying to discuss and try to improve. So that's something that I commit to you that we'll continue to do. Um, and at the end of the board meeting, uh, when we ask about future agenda items, at some point, maybe this summer, uh, I'd like to have a workshop on, on discipline, uh, just so that we can review some of our policies and look at some of the data to actually see the changes that we are feeling uh, on some of our school sites and we're seeing on social media. Uh, and this being our last meeting before graduation, I also want to express thanks and gratitude to our entire RUSD community. We have some amazing classified staff and teachers. Uh, some of you spoke today. Uh, just grateful for you. We know that your profession is uh, at times a very difficult one, and it's a calling. Uh, and the work that you do uh, is, is greatly appreciated and tremendously important and, and very valued so that if we can find more ways to help support you uh, to do the job that you do, we want to hear those things. So we encourage you to, to, to come to board meetings and share those with us, uh, to email us, uh, to stop us in the hallway. We're, we're always willing to listen uh, to make your job uh, even, even better. So thank you for being here and thanks for, uh, for a great year. I know it's not always easy. Uh, also, congratulations to all of our graduating students uh, like Lauren this year. I uh, wish you lots of success moving forward. Uh, look forward to attending Lincoln High School's graduation tomorrow and North High School's next week uh, and Earhart's promotion also. Um, I think I had one more thing I wanted to share. Uh, also, yeah, thank you to uh, RCTA and CSEA for their, their um, separate events that they were recognizing. All their employees had a great time. I uh, enjoyed chatting with all the members that were there and celebrating another year in RUSD. And uh, that's, that's it for me, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Dr. Noemi Hernandez-Alexander. Uh, thank you. I will start. Um, just to, I'm really happy to highlight some of the many, many accomplishments of our students and schools in this academic year. And so I want to uh, commend our educators in the room and our students. Am I not on? No, you're on. Okay. Okay. So. I want to highlight a couple of things. Um, over at Rivera High uh, Elementary School, uh, we now have a beautiful mural that is in the front of the school. Uh, I want to commend the leadership there, Mrs. Fulmer and Mr. Luke, for seeing this to fruition. We had a talented group of muralists, uh, Barry Betker, Karina Acosta, Hugo Huerta, and Tom Siebert um, from Murals for Schools. They brought such vibrancy to the campus, and so I want to thank them. Uh, this month, I was honored to uh, join the Maintenance, Operations, and Transportation Department for Classified Appreciation Week. Uh, I met many dedicated persons that give their time and their talent to make sure that our schools are secure and safe and functioning every day. I appreciate the, the many highly skilled classified staff that serve our district. The, from the accountant to the aide in the classroom to the supervisor that plays basketball with kids on the playground, our lunch staff that loves in, uh, our kids so well with a nutritious meal and a smile, and the nightly crew that cleans every night. Um, they sacrifice their sleep and their time with their family to clean our schools, and we are so very grateful for that. Teachers, I honor you. I honor you for the way that you've responded to the calling that you have uh, on your life here on this earth. And so uh, I thank you and I honor you. Um, we are committed to supporting you and talking about solutions to better resource you so that you can continue to, to do your job and not retire early uh, and to see yourself uh, retire um, uh, feeling like you were supported. I also attended uh, the CTE Live Student Showcase, which was 
so incredible to see students' inventions. Um, they were very creative and to see their technical skills and all that they have mastered throughout the years. Uh, this year, we also got to attend the DLI celebration. This was the first ever graduating cohort uh, of uh, dual language immersion students. It was a very exciting time. There was lots of tears. Congratulations to the graduates and to their teachers who walked alongside them this entire time from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. Uh, those students are clearly prepared uh, for a bright future. So lastly, um, I've been charged with addressing uh, some of the conversations that we've talked about tonight. Uh, and so buckle in because uh, I, I'm, it's gonna be a little bit lengthy. Uh, lastly, uh, so I, I like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that yes, uh, Mr. Hunt and myself received an invitation from assembly member Siley uh, to, a town, to his town hall meeting this past Tuesday uh, to discuss policies related to discipline in schools. We offered as a first step and as a courtesy uh, to meet with him to answer any questions he had about education and about our district and to offer information that might help advance a productive discussion about student and staff safety. This is a topic that is of a daily importance to the board and our school district employees and the students and the families that we serve. Yes, we do wake up every morning thinking about how to keep our students and our teachers safe. We were in contact with uh, the assembly member prior to the town hall and as a result of our communication, we came to the discussion, the decision that this meeting was not just for RUSD families, thus not productive to attend. Because we were here for you, because we are here for you every Thursday, every board meeting, we hear your concerns, we listen, we take notes, we take it back to the staff and we respond to your concerns in between board meetings. So I will read to you the letter that we did send to the assembly member, and it's the rationale behind. Thank you for your invitation to attend the town hall meeting on May, uh, for May 16th. We agree with your statement that the elected officials have an obligation to hear from their constituents and act in their best interest. The Riverside Unified School District Governing Board holds public meetings, usually once or twice per month, during which members of the public can comment on any concerns within the subject matter and jurisdiction of the board. The district also maintains effective channels of communication through school site administrators, district office administrators, caring teachers, and other education professionals. We are constantly learning from our parents and our community and are pleased to see that you are showing an interest in education and the significant challenges we face. As stated in our letter on May 8th, we would be delighted to work with you and address the unique needs of our district, public policy related and public policy related K through 12 discipline and non-discrimination and student privacy and, the con and to consider policy solutions and recommendations. We noted that our goal is to seek a consensus and to work with our local electeds to help us carry our mission forward. We believe that a panel discussion or working group that includes other members of the legislature representing the communities served by RUSD would be the most efficient and productive way to work together toward our shared goals. The reason this makes sense is that the state legislature enacts laws that govern California education agencies. The RUSD governing board has no authority to adopt local policies or practices that conflict with those laws. Although we have open public meetings on a frequent basis, we understand that this is less common for legislators to host meetings at which their constituents can be heard. It makes perfect sense that you would conduct a town hall meeting about issues that will shape your legislative agenda. At the same time, it may be misleading for us to attend a town hall meeting that might give the impression that our board has the ability to change local policies governed by state and federal law, which we cannot. While we, don't, while we won't be attending the town hall on May 16th, our invitation to meet with you and your staff in June or July still stands. In closing, we affirm that student and employee safety is our top priority, and we welcome solutions that will benefit our California schools. As we proudly wrap up our school year, we celebrate student accomplishments, including graduations. We remain committed to the student learning and well-being, and are not interested in engaging in political division. 
Thank you again for taking interest in education and, and student safety. Please note that all communications related to the Board of Education are centralized and come from the superintendent and communications offices only. Respectfully signed, Superintendent Renee Hill, myself, and Mr. Hunt. That was the letter that was sent to the assembly member. So we remain committed. We commit to prioritizing kids and teachers' safety. We remain committed to work towards providing a high quality education. Yes, we wake up every morning thinking about how we can improve both. I am committed to the RUSD parents to earn your trust, but I will not lie to you just to win it over. There were many misleading assertions made from the out of town electeds on that panel. As your trustee, I feel the responsibility to tell you the truth. But I will not, but I will only correct two misleading points. One was the conversation about the dashboard. There was an assertion made that the district chooses not to discipline students to get a better grade on the dashboard. That is not the purpose of the dashboard. It is an indicator of an aggregated outcomes that the state publishes for transparency and so that we can look at trends and outcomes and districts can make adjustments. It is not used to reward or to penalize schools. That is a notion that harkens back to No Child Left Behind, a federal education policy that has been repealed at least over 15 years ago. The fact is that the California dashboard shows that our USD suspension rates have actually increased over the past six years. Some of you are happy to see that, some of us are not. Our USD is actually higher than the state's average in suspension rates. And this is verifiable in the dashboard. Another lie is that the wellness centers are somehow going to become abortion clinics on campus. That is more than political, and it is more than inaccurate. It is inconceivable, let alone feasible or practical. Wellness centers will not become medical facilities. That is not true. Even if you say it over and over again, it is not true. I will be reaching out for solutions, in fact, uh, I want to continue to work together. I liked many of the solutions that our educators that are in the classroom brought forth today. I would, like to, I would like for you to email them to me. I will compile them. And when we do bring together a workshop around discipline, we would like to incorporate them in our solutions within the scope of the things that we can actually, actually do um, as a board. So I will uh, support a workshop on discipline this summer, and I hope that's something that we can move forward on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noemi Hernandez, uh, Alexander, uh, Trustee Tom Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Farouk, Dr. Farouk, excuse me. Uh, and thank you, Trustee Alexander, um, excuse me, Hernandez Alexander, that was very well put. I'm gonna add a little bit. I wanna make a point of clarification that the first time I found out about Mr. Asaley's invitation was on, was on social media. And I talked to him Sunday before last. Mr. Saley never, he said he invited Tom Hunt and Dr. Alexander. He never invited us. I never got a call from his office. I, he never called the district. And I told him, you know, Bill, that's just common courtesy, but the place is out there. And it, it is bizarre that one of my friends, uh, uh, wife down in Marietta, he and I went to high school with, his wife is a very outstanding, uh, uh, councilwoman there. She called me and said, hey, I'm coming. What? Wait a minute, this is about Riverside Unified, and, and but you're inviting folks from Marietta and Temecula. As a governing board, our job is to uphold California state laws. As, as, as my colleague said, we do not have the ability to implement by law local policies. Though there will be some who would advocate that, it is untrue and it is impossible. We implement the policy, the law is promulgated by the legislative branch and then to the executive branch. And if that gets approved and or vetoed, then it goes to the prop appropriate state department who develops the policies, who sends those to Mr. Walker, who reviews. And we have those and adopted exactly as, as they are sent by the state. Um, as explained uh, by my colleague, we have invited 
uh, Assembly Member Saley to, to meet with us and address the unique needs of RUSD to discuss public policy related to K-12 discipline and discrimination, student privacy, student rights, and to consider policy solutions with him and recommendations. We know we will have a collaborative meeting, but I'm going to suggest, Mr. President and my colleagues and, and Superintendent, that inviting just Sacramento as a partisan, let's understand that atmosphere, and it, but by our founding fathers and by in every state, uh, it is a collaborative effort. And so I contend that including inviting Bill Seeley, we should also invite the other legislators that represent the boundaries of our USD, Ms. Cervantes, Mr. Jackson, Senator Roth, and particularly Senator uh, Ochoa Bogue, since the lady sits on the uh, Senate's Education Committee. And when you follow legislation, it's those committees and not so much the, a member outside that committee, Congress or state, that can have influence. Um, and uh, I, I hope that moves forward. I do hear you as well about, in fact, I wanted to say to whoever said that, I keep a picture of my children up here. Now, both girls have graduated RUSD schools, but I want to remember what it is like as a parent to hear these things. And it is disturbing to me, and I thank Mrs. Ritter for bringing forward examples of pending legislation, which bewilder in bewilderment are going to even further hamstring state education, a district, a campus, and a classroom in student discipline. I will say it again, as I said last meeting, Sacramento is aired on the side for sometimes they're concerned about, and as we all should be, uh, the classroom to prison pipeline. 80% of the felons in the California penal system are high school dropouts. It's not too hard to figure this out. But erring on the, trying to help the child that is causing the discipline problem forgets about the other 24 to 30 in that classroom. But I thank you, Ms. Ritter, for bringing those forward. And again, they are, are bizarre. I do want to assure you, when people, when some some members have mistakenly said, some members of our public, that we don't listen, and some of you came to those LCAP meetings where we listened, the LCAP budget will be coming forward very soon, and it will include additional campus supervisors, not just at our secondary schools, but at every elementary school. We are concerned as well. Thank you, teachers. I have talked to many teachers. Uh, this year, and uh, one of them to capsulize what she said. She said, Tom, this has been my, and she's close to 30 years, my roughest year in teaching. And I said, why? And she said, well, the after effects, the social, emotional effects of COVID that are still disruptive. The lack of my ability to exercise discipline in my classroom. And equally distressing, and not so much with you that are here tonight, but the, the, the much lessening parent engagement, they just seem to, you know, I mean, I'm not everyone, but they don't seem to be as involved anymore. We that grew up in good homes where our parents were involved, sometimes over-involved, uh, now can look at that as, as what a blessing it, it was. I, we do need to talk to the state, and we do that through the California School Boards Association. We do that, we will do that with the forum uh, that uh, my colleague has talked about. We invited Mr. Saley, and I, again, I stress that we need to invite his colleagues in the Assembly and the Senate because they need to all hear it and need to be upfront about how they can, they can change this. I know that Mr. Saley re recently, and just to emphasize that point with respect to the gentleman, he recently introduced some legislation that would have, uh, if enacted and passed and signed, would have uh, overturned the can't tell the parents about certain items, particularly gender identification. The, the leadership of the assembly, because uh, he's not on the Ed Committee, did assign it to the Ed Committee, and after a very short time, it was rejected. So that's what many of your wishes, which aren't a majority, 
um, do uh, what they're up against. That's what Mr. Saley's up against. So it, that's the, uh, we are all very concerned. Mr. Lee and Mr. Farouk and Dr. Hernandez Alexander are parents, as I am. And uh, my little girl was bullied uh, at a Christian school. And uh, yeah, I went through the roof as well because they were going to hold her responsible because she was in the third grade and a boy in the eighth grade threw milk on her at, at lunchtime. You can imagine any of you and did what I would do and I went to be sure that that was corrected. So I empathize with what you're going through. I empathize with the, those that want to see a normalcy, particularly teachers, return to California education. But the legislature needs to listen. And that's why Mr. Jackson and Ms. Cervantes and the two senators need to be here. Last week, I attended our uh, Casablanca Community Action Group, CAG, where newly appointed, and I, I was so pleased they asked me, uh, or newly appointed um, Casablanca principal, Bernie Torres was introduced. Uh, to say that he was warmly received would be an under understatement. Uh, and Bernie is already very involved with the community, and, and I commend him for that. Also present was uh, the area commander from RPD and one of our assistant principals at Ramona, where they strive to clarify and wipe away the hyperbole uh, that was fostered on on social media regarding the fight, student fight about three weeks ago at Ramona. And uh, it just shows us too, as I said before, uh, the importance of, of uh, media communications. But I thank the RPD who has, has been very involved. I spoke with, uh, I haven't got to tell you this yet, Superintendent, but uh, uh, Ryan Relsback, uh, Lieutenant Ryan Relsback, who's the spokesperson for RPD has, has spoke with uh, and met with our uh, communications officer, Ms. Meza, and, and uh, we're gonna do more in collaboration, not just, uh, we're gonna meet and then look at, at press releases and announcements as well. And I, I really do thank them. The chairperson of the CAG, Bobby Garcia, did take the lead in, to report on the outstanding discussions, his word, with the district's academic team uh, for the curriculum proposed that will be proposed at Casablanca Elementary to include coding, STEM, and very perhaps dual immersion. And I, I do look forward to that. As Mr. Lee uh, indicated, I, along with my fellow trustees, I very much look forward to participating and I'm honored to be asked in graduation ceremonies next week at Martin Luther King High School, our Educational Opportunities Campus, and uh, Gage Miller uh, Middle School. I particularly like talking to eighth graders and to remind the parents if they w and remind them, like it or not, this is high school's the beginning of the fork in the road for all of us of so where you're gonna go to be diligent. And I do turn to the parents and say, as I say to you, and I believe you know, that, uh, that if you want your child to do well in school, uh, then you need to go to high school too. Uh, one of my daughters didn't like that and the other one embraced it, but it's where we go. Uh, and I commend our faculty and our, our school administrators and our classified staff, the amazing people they are, for, for bringing us to the end of the school year and successfully. I did attend the 25 most remarkable teens. Uh, I'm sure in this city there could have been 10 times that amount. They were all very impressive. They came from Alvord Unified, Riverside Unified, and private campuses such as uh, Woodcrest and Notre Dame. Among those 25 included our student board member, Lauren Briscoe. Lauren, uh, we're all very proud of you and, and uh, oh, she left, but I'm sorry. Maybe she'll watch later. I'm very proud of Lauren Briscoe and, and we all should be. Uh, the grade point averages uh, displayed were exceptional. Thank you, oh, and I, I will, uh, I, I did attend, excuse me, just one last thing. I did attend the uh, teacher appreciation picnic uh, last week up at the, uh, uh, the Orange Park. Uh, always an uplifting event. And there I got to also speak with more teachers and thank many of them who were retiring that ever showed up. And I, 
I don't know. Did you hear what time Anna he said that their event is on Saturday? Um, I'll check with her. Yeah. I, so uh, I have a Casablanca meeting from 10 to noon, but I do want to be there. Thank you all for coming. We do, we do listen. It's hard to, under the Brown Act, to respond directly. But I hope that our actions, such as the LCAP and adding more campus supervisors, uh, indicate that we are, we are listening and we do want to. I like your idea of, of a workshop and better informing our teachers and campus as to what their procedures are for discipline, which again, unfortunately, our, the state legislature has greatly lessened. But we, like adding campus soups, need to compensate as much as we can. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Trustee Dale Kinnear. Thank you. I didn't prepare formal remarks for uh, board comments, uh, but I'm compelled to, to talk. So if I ramble a bit, uh, uh, please just bear, bear with me. I, I too wake up every morning uh, thinking about our, our kids in our school district. Uh, I've been a high school principal in this school district for 24 years. I've had some of your kids. Uh, some of you have been teachers of mine. Uh, some of your parents have been teachers of, 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 of mine. I know the importance of, of, of discipline. I, I understand it. We have to hold kids accountable and lots of things are happening now that need our attention. This board is listening and this board is paying attention. I'm paying attention. It's time that we do something. I think a meeting this summer about, about discipline and consequences and, uh, and about our expectations is an appropriate one uh, as we set the stage for a new school year. Uh, I'm worried that the pendulum has swung. Uh, when the pendulum in our business swings from one side to another, uh, it oftentimes worries me. Uh, so I worry that we're not holding kids as accountable uh, for their actions as I, as I think that uh, that we should. And, yeah, yeah. I really don't. I really don't want applause because all of this is is serious work uh, on all of our parts. Uh, I think. I was going to say it later, and I will say it later, but one of the alarming things that I just saw is that in our LCAP documents that, uh, that half of our teachers are concerned ab about safety in our schools. If half of our teachers are concerned about safety in schools, what are our kids and, and, uh, and parents thinking? Uh, so I, I see it, my colleagues see it, and yes, we need to, uh, to do something uh, about it. Uh, they're not easy problems to solve, but I can assure you that, uh, that we will work hard to, uh, to, to do just, just that. Uh, I've heard people comment about wanting data. I think data is important for us to, uh, to understand what we're doing and, and, uh, and, and how we're doing it. So I expect that that data will be forthcoming. I want to hear from, from principals and, and, uh, and more from teachers. The teachers here tonight, you've, been, uh, you, you, you've, been, uh, you've opened up my eyes uh, even further. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you, teachers. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, uh, and, uh, and I can assure you that this board will, uh, will do that work. I also want to assure you that we can't politicize this, and, and to some degree, we are. And maybe some people are doing that to get our attention. Well, if that's the case, you have our attention. You have my attention. Uh, however, our wellness centers aren't abortion clinics. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not happening. Uh, that, that's being said to, to, uh, to alarm people and, and, to, and, and, to, and to scare people. Do we need to pay more attention to, uh, to state legislation? Uh, I, I know that I do. I'm concerned about uh, Assembly Bill 274 and 1299. We can't allow those bills to, uh, to, to pass. So I need to speak up as a board member. Uh, I think this board needs to, uh, to, to, to speak up. So you're being listened to. We care. Uh, uh, I, can, I can assure you with all of my experience as a, as a high school principal, I know how important uh, this is uh, for our, all of our children and, and parents and, and our community. Thanks for letting me ramble. I'll talk more as, uh, as we have other board meetings. 
Thank you uh, for your thoughtful comments, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, for my comments, I want to lead with the fact that this is a, a meeting that we're having towards the conclusion of our, our school year. And to really uh, celebrate and honor and pr provide perspective retrospectively of, of the achievements that our students have done, the hard work that our employees, all of, all of the 4,000 plus employees that they've done to help make those opportunities possible, the parents' dedication uh, for our students graduating. Uh, it's an extraordinary achievement and we're here to support them. We always look forward to those uh, speeches that, uh, and participations that we have uh, next week, the promotion ceremonies, uh, even the transitions from grade to grade. All of it is important. There are important distinctions and the older we each get in life, the more we realize how uh, important each of those uh, distinctions are. So I really want to celebrate our, our students and have that at the forefront of my mind. Uh, in re regards to some of the, the discussions that, and I appreciate the sentiments shared from my colleagues, uh, I know that CSEA has brought up issues um, regarding some concerns with the department and uh, you know, I hope our staff continue to follow up on that. Um, re regarding teachers, uh, I really want to ex express my appreciation for you to, to share those um, very emotional and personal experiences. I know it's not easy. Um, you know, I, as, as my, some of my colleagues mentioned, I'm a parent in this district also. I have, my daughter goes to RUSD, so it's, uh, it's, the whole issue is personal about the state of the district and the future of the district. Uh, and I know that these are uh, very difficult circumstances. I know, as Trustee Kinnear mentioned, um, the sh if, the, if uh, community members are making requests on data, I, it shouldn't hopefully be more than a meeting in between and that they are able to provide that information. So I hope that that data information is provided. Um, I, I am completely supportive uh, of having that workshop in the summer that my colleagues suggested. Uh, I'll work with uh, Superintendent Hill on getting that uh, scheduled. Um, I appreciate Trustee Hunt bringing uh, one of the tangible things that the, how the board is responding with our LCAP investments regarding campus supervisors. Uh, these are the tangible things within our, our parameters of what we can do. Um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll close about this is uh, I know that there's a, a sense of urgency and I know that there's a sense of uh, not wanting to attribute what, uh, what's not possible to, to what is. And it does need to be clearly defined uh, between the legislative scope and what uh, the, the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictional capabilities that a school district has. Uh, the campus supervisors, the funding allocations and things of that nature, um, that's straightforward. I ask our, our staff to prepare uh, 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 options uh, that go beyond the, the funding aspects, which we're continuing to respond and address uh, through LCAP and other matters. But what are the full range of uh, tools and uh, options that we can uh, empower our, our employees, our valued employees, uh, so, and, and our campuses to, for everyone to feel safe that they rightfully deserve? And so in that spirit, um, even prior to this uh, summer convening uh, on the workshop, uh, I've uh, already reached out to RCTA uh, and spoken with Superintendent Hill to uh, make a, both of us jointly available to our, our employees and start first taking that information that staff will prepare about the that range of options and uh, directly be able to start um, having uh, addressing those comments and hearing further input from all of you um, in between uh, that, the, uh, that time frame. Uh, due to the Brown Act, um, majority of our board cannot, you know, participate in that. But I'll first extend it to Trustee Kinnear if he's uh, amenable to joining me as a vice president, uh, and we can go about it that way. And each of my colleagues independently um, can have those conversations, which I know they are having informally, irrespective of that. But uh, having the that formal aspect, I think symbolically, uh, we work as board members. We work through our, our staff and our admi administration that we have confidence in with our superintendent, um, but by us uh, injecting ourselves to do this jointly, uh, hopefully that elevates this, the sense of importance uh, and uh, of how we are responding to this. So I hope uh, that, you know, that that for, for what it's worth um, is, a, you know, recognized and appreciated. And again, thank you for taking the time 
to share your thoughts on all matters uh, to our board. We welcome the civic engagement. We have uh, some public input regarding board member comments. Three comment cards. Uh, Sandy R. followed by Roy Blackguard, followed by uh, Ro Rocio Mejia. So, uh, Ms. R., you're welcome. You have three minutes. Okay, so first I'm going to finish what I didn't finish, and it's shameful that Ms. Briscoe isn't here to hear it because last meeting she claimed, or two meetings ago, she claimed that it's a very extensive detailed process for a student to, you know, claim that they are a transgender. So I'm going to read an excerpt from your policy, determining a student's gender identity. The compliance officer shall accept the student's assertion of gender identity and begin to treat the student consistent with that gender identity unless district personnel present a credible and supportable basis for believing that that student's assertion is of improper purpose. So what was a credible and supportable basis do you have for me for sending me that harassing letter? Was it my faith? Was it the fact that I'm a mother? Should I say that I'm a birthing person and maybe if I don't come up here and say I'm a mother? Um, See, the reality is that your policy and the state policies are so ambiguous that you don't get to have a say in mine or anyone else's gender claims. Gender can be situational. According to your the policy- board, Our board did not comment on these items that you're raising. Um, you, you commented about the situation with the fights. So I, I'm almost done and then I'm gonna shift to the next topic. You're taking my time. So um, now here we are telling me that I have no right to use the men's restroom. Let's see if you are prepared to defend your stance because you tried to get me to challenge it by going in there again because you would love nothing more than the opportunity to ban me from your meetings, but I got so much more to expose, so I'm not gonna take that risk because I've got a lot, to, a lot of work to do here. So this is to Dr. Noemi and Mr. Hunt. That meeting wasn't about you. It wasn't about you. Only a narcissist thinks it's about them and controlling the situation and saying it has to be on our terms, on our location. That was about going to that community and saying to them, we hear you. And you couldn't do that, but I guarantee you'll be at the east side. You guys were at the LCAP meetings, um, the LCAP town halls, those weren't a problem, but you wouldn't go there and spend that time hearing from that community in Orange Crest that just elected you, Dr. Hernandez, and you won't even make eye contact with me. You forgot to mention you were at Miller where you ran into me. Um, the next thing, um, you say that they're not gonna be um, abortion centers or anything like that. We've already seen other campuses that are already doing that with their wellness centers. And I asked Dr. Farouk, as someone who sits on the board of Planned Parenthood, what is their intention? What is their intention? Is that the end goal? I mean, we, we have seen what's gone on in other districts. We know what's coming. We're not gonna have blinders and then at the last minute go, oh, gee, that's what it is. You're actively encouraging our students to attend these wellness centers. You're sending text messages directly to students, encouraging them to visit the, the wellness centers. Why? They can't consent to any type of um, psychiatric services and that's why they're trying to pass legislation to change that. But right now they currently cannot consent. Our next speaker is Roy Blackguard, followed by CEO Mejia. Welcome, Mr. Blackguard. You have three minutes. Let's explore Mr. Hunt's logic. I didn't know about no meeting, yet there was a letter by, signed by Hernandez, Hunt, and Hill saying we declined to attend. I think you just shot your credibility with a 12-gauge shotgun, Mr. Hunt. Can you believe anything these say? These people say up here, Miss Alexander, with the flowery this and oh that and ah, uh, spare us this. This is darn serious of what's going on here, and all you got to talk about is platitudes and diversity and equity and inclusion and all this other crap that goes on. Go check your emails. I sent it sent it to the PIO requesting anybody three weeks ago about this issue to come on my show and discuss this, and I got a no, we're not going to, and a little statement that I read on the air. So don't give me this, oh, we care, and oh, we want to hear. That's plain BS, and the evidence, I think, will show that. Oh, we don't want to talk to that. You know why I'm here, Mr. Hunt? The sergeant from RPD said at that meeting, they're sending the disciplined kids from Marina Valley Unified Crime Syndicate right into King High School. 
Maybe that's a problem. Maybe you don't know about it because you didn't attend the meeting. But no, we don't want, oh, people come up from Temecula and Murrieta. Oh, maybe they might come from Redlands. Oh, maybe they might come from Chino. Maybe they'll come from India. We don't want them in our district. You don't want to meet with them. You don't want to do that. You know, why don't you have a joint study session with the school districts around here, invite all them in. That's within your purview to do. When have you done it? But you care. Oh, we just, we care just like you. The principal here. Oh, I care and I did this and that. Where are you doing this? You guys know this. You've been in public policy, most of you, a long time. You know how to do this. You refuse to do it. You haven't done it. What I'm looking at is a bunch of people with no guts, no caring. We listen to what you say. More importantly, and why all these people are here, we've watched what you do. And we will continue to do that. And you can ignore us, but you will ignore us at your peril. Okay, our next speaker is Rocio Mejia. Welcome, Ms. Mejia, you have three minutes. Thank you very much for letting me speak again. Um, I just want to say that I'm very thankful to the teachers who came out and spoke because they poured their heart out to you guys asking for help and you saying that you're going to help them, can you please include a time in this, in this solution that you're trying to help them with? Please include a time because I don't think it's fair to a, our USD student to have to watch the teacher pin somebody down. A, a, a child this age should not be experiencing that. Um, I just think it's gotten completely out of control from the teachers and it's not the teacher's fault. It's everybody's fault. Like if you wanna look at it, they don't have the power to remove that student from their classroom. So um, it's very concerning. And I feel like talk is cheap and actions speak louder than words. And um, just return their ability to just teach, which is, you can tell they love to teach. They love their students. This is Miss Trent's student. Um, I asked my daughter if she feels safe in her classroom and she responded no. So that is just, it makes me sad. And it made me sadder to see the teachers almost in tears and not to be able to do their job properly, which is what they went to college for and what they prepared for, not for having the issues that they're having, the behavioral issues. Um, that takes training and some students, I hate to say it, but they don't belong in a regular classroom setting. Um, it's not because you're being discriminative, it's just because it's not fair to the other students. Um, we have to respect the right of every student, which is their rights and, and every student's rights. And I would like to also congratulate the first class of um, dual immersion, Polly's first class of dual immersion. Um, and thank Ms. Romero, Senora Romero, Senora Capisano, Senora Tedford, who I saw firsthand put all their heart and soul into these kids who would attend every single um, graduation. Rosanna Rodriguez is my niece and I wanna congratulate her and congratulate all the students in their endeavors. Um, and also I wanna say, can we call everything by its name when we're, being, when we're being transparent, just calling everything by its name. We're not allowed to say bullying. We're not allowed, we're, we okay, should. Thank you for your comments. You. We, we will now proceed to our consent calendar item.
All items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the board vote unless members of the board request to have specific items removed from the consent calendar. Trustee Hunt, do we have any uh, public comment? Okay, now uh, we're proceeding to my colleagues, Trustee Kinnear, you wanted to pull an item? Yes, I want to, uh, to pull items 9 through 17. Okay. Do we, does anybody else want to pull any items? Okay. Um, we can entertain a motion. I'll, I'll move to approve the, uh, all, all the items except for 9 through 17 that Trustee Kinnear has Mo Motion by Trustee Hunt. Second by Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Please vote. Okay, if we can please, uh, is it Mr. San Martin that would speak to present on the items 9 to 17? Is it? I have, I have comments to make. Oh, okay, please defer to your comments, Trustee. Thanks. I, th I think many of, of the consent agenda items are numbered randomly, so uh, I want to change the order a bit, and I, I want to talk about consent agenda items 14 to 17 first. In October of, of 2021, we, and when I say we, I mean the, this board, committed $190 million to facilities projects. This $190 million included remaining Measure O dollars, in addition to other facilities funds, such as redevelopment, ESSER, development fees, developer fees, etc. These other funds accounted for not only current balances at the time, but also projected revenue. We were told at that time, there are no more dollars. Of that 190 million, our direction was to commit $10 million to the project team facility. At a board meeting 11 months later, just this last September, we heard an update on the, pro on the progress by the architect. The $10 million project budget was reaffirmed in this update. Go back to just last September's board meeting and you'll see a $10 million project for project team. Just a few weeks ago, approximately six months after the board meeting, uh, at a subcommittee meeting, Mr. Hunt and I were told that the projected costs increased by 50% for a total of $15 million for project team. I'm completely supportive of project team. I'm bringing up this information for two reasons. First, nowhere in the consent agenda do we have mention that the projected costs increased by 50% for a total of $50 million. A 50% increase in six months is alarming. The community should know about that kind of increase. Second, we identified five million additional dollars with no public board discussion when we said there were no more dollars. I want to make sure we're all aware of this. We should all know how we're paying for this and how decisions are made in regard to this five million dollars. On another topic, as we're negotiating a community workforce agreement, I'm told of increased costs as a reason to, po to oppose the action. I'm wondering how I'm going to identify those potential increases when we have a 50% increase in a project in less than six months, and that's without a CWA. Now on to, to, to the poly agenda items, number nine through 13. Items 9 through 13, or not the poly agenda item, the north agenda item. Got confused with my old schools. Items 9 through 13 relate to the north HVAC project funded by the $11 million ESSER allocation discussed at that October 21st meeting when we also decided on the $10 million project team budget that's now $15 million. Because there is no presentation in the consent agenda, what you don't see is just as project team is over budget, the North HVAC project is also over budget. However, in the North project, we're not increasing the budget to cover the additional dollars. 
Rather, we're reducing the scope of work by postponing the HVAC project in the administration and library classroom buildings. We're postponing this work in order to meet the budget and we will do a future bid for these HVACs when we do the North Measure O Science Building and Gym Project. In my mind's eye, this is just kicking the can down the road. If we don't have the money for the HVAC in the administration and library classroom buildings at this time, how are we going to have it when we complete the transformation project? I'm not playing favorites with the North community. I've worked with the Eastside leaders for over 30 years. Approving these funds and contracts in the consent agenda without future dialogue will promote mistrust. I know that's not our intent. That's clearly not our intent. So let's hold a board dialogue about future facility funds, their use, how we're making decisions. We identified additional money for project team, but not for the North HVAC project. If the information that I just said is inaccurate, please correct me now. Otherwise, let's hold that conversation at a future board meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Superintendent Hill, would you like to respond or de designate Mr. San Martin? Thank you, President Farouk. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear, for pulling this item. This is an important item. In fact, this is a follow-up from our September 2022 board meeting when the board was presented an update on the project. In fact, at that time, the board was also presented and the board took action awarding phase one bids for project team. At that time, the board was informed that the, pro that the project was over a million dollars over. However, still within the budget, the contingency was fully exhausted. At that time, President Lee gave direction to staff to start looking at additional funding sources in order to um, resolve future escalations as it was projected at that time and the board was informed as many of our projects have been over due to the inflation escalation and just the construction market how it has been in the past five years in fact many of our projects have been adjusted when we bring to you before the board takes action on awarding contracts at uh, the september 22 meeting again that was the phase one of the project bids and in that board meeting, I informed the board that phase two, which is tonight, we're bringing the rest of the bids to complete project team. In this meeting, this is, in fact, I'm glad that you brought it up because at the April Operation Facility Subcommittee, we brought to, your, to the board's attention, the subcommittee, that uh, staff, great news, that the redevelopment funds of the 10 million, which you, you are exactly correct, Back in 2021, the board did allocate 10 million. However, uh, at the direction of, of um, the board, we have been exploring other funding sources, which the board was informed over a year ago that we were qualifying for ESSER funds, which replaced the 10 million from redevelopment to ESSER funds. Um, the board was also informed through board mail and information that um, in, in the June board meeting, also in the September board meeting, that um, ESSER funds were being utilized for this specific project. So tonight, the board, uh, we're asking before you take action on this item, that 10 million budget has turned into a $14.2 million project budget. 12 million will be funded out of ESSER funds, which the board has been informed. And at the request of uh, President Lee at that time, we have looked for some other funding sources, knowing that the escalation was gonna be over the 10 million, um, 2.3, has been identified using redevelopment funds that originally were part of the, of the project team. So bringing that 12 million from ESSER, 2.3 from redevelopment, will bring us even to the 14.3 million that we need to complete this project. So if the board will take action tonight, uh, we will be fully funded to move forward with project team. And we've done what board president Lee has asked us to do to identify the funding sources to complete this project. So thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Uh, because this is an important project and the great news is that this project is also qualifying for state funding. We have been informed, which we informed the subcommittee in April, that this project um, is qualifying for three additional mil $3 million from state funding. 
So with that, um, that's information on project team. Thank you for that e explanation. Uh, I might add that I went back to our October meeting. In our, in our October meeting of 2022, uh, which was less than six months ago, the, the $10 million project budget is what's listed uh, in that agenda item. There was no board discussion uh, that in my notes uh, that, uh, that, 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 that we uh, approved to, to look at a, additional funds to go over the project. Now, I'm supportive, so I'm, I'm voting yes on this. W what I'm concerned about is, is how the decision was made and where the board dialogue w uh, was uh, as it relates to this. We have some very, very difficult uh, challenges ahead of us with the use of facilities dollars. Uh, we all know that that's going to happen. If we don't have board dialogue and board decision making, uh, then we're, uh, we're going to frustrate our community. Uh, we're going to develop mistrust with our community. Uh, and and I, I don't see it as necessary. Dialogue will take care of this. I would just like to add that um, we do need dialogue and board members have the opportunity to request dialogue every meeting. Um, we don't know and won't ever know the true cost of the project until it's bid. So there's always going to be a lag. You and I already talked about this. There's going to be a lag. So at which points we um, need to update, that's fine. Um, when we had the October uh, 2019 meeting, or the, the, yeah, I think 2019, 2020, where we um, allocated the $190 million. It did include the an estimate of ongoing funds, but we also said that funds flows come into the district. So yes, discussions about those dollars, but it's not like um, having those discussions were hidden or intentionally kept away from anybody the the board was updated the subcommittee was updated and when we get the actual cost of the project we have to true up the um funding sources to the cost i guess i want to make it clear that uh, that i never said that it was the intent of uh, of this uh, of our district or the or the board to uh, deceit somebody i don't think that was that was that that was never anybody's intent however we never had the dialogue uh, at a board subcommittee uh, we never had a board dialogue at uh, at, at this dais as as it, as it relates to the additional five million dollars i'm more than happy to uh to um uh propose that that uh, that we vote uh, for these uh, uh, projects, but I want to have that dialogue in the future. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Before we do that, Tr Trustee Hunt, you wanted to add something? My little microphone here. Th thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, if I may, Superintendent and Mr. San Martin, uh, the, the escalation at, at North High School for the HVAC package units, uh, Help me understand it, what that was and, and what is, as Mr. Kinnear was laying out, what is your plan to, uh, you know, to, to move that forward without any uh, deletions of anything? Thank you, Mr. Hunt. The HVAC project, it's HVAC and lighting project specifically. Um, we have bid phase one and phase two, which the board has awarded back in December. Um, what's What's on the agenda tonight is phase three of the HVAC lighting project. Um, that is uh, a full classroom science, uh, an existing science classroom that's being renovated with HVAC and lighting and finishes and so forth. Uh, part of that project also is the administration office and the library, which have not been bid it yet. We are not postponing. We're actually bidding it this summer with the rest of the transformation project. Oh, okay. The transformation project includes the brand new two-story science building and also the new gymnasium with all this, the site work and finishes and site improvements. Now, Mr. Kinnear is exactly correct because of what we've seen in the construction market of escalations. Uh, most likely, we're going to be over the 11.5 that was allocated uh, by the board to use for the HVC lighting project. Now, that scope of work is being funded also by ESSER funds. And as you recall, in fact, Mr. Hunt, back in a year ago, you, you gave direction to us to look at uh, what Congressman Takano 
had, uh, we gave us the flexibility to use ESSER funds for construction work, which we took advantage, and it's part of what we've been using and doing to maximize our dollars. So thank you for that, because we were able, we were able to utilize ESSER funds for these types of projects. Um, the truth is that we will see escalations. In the summer, when we bid these projects, the phase four of the, of the HVAC and lighting with the transformation project, we will bring to the board then um, the actual numbers of the bids and where those shortfalls of escalations are going to hit that project. At that time, we would hope to have at least a funding source to make up like we bring it tonight with, with project team and what we've done with other projects that we bring to the board with other funding sources. If there is no other funding source, then we will have to provide you with a recommendation of how we value engineer that scope of work. Thank you. Very, very thorough answer, Mr. S Assistant Superintendent. Um, I do want to just share with my colleagues, and, and Trustee Kinnear brought it forward, and Mr. San Martin was just talking about escalation. Um, as you know, I'm a consultant to uh, retail, housing uh, developers, and, and also clean energy. And uh, one of my clients, who this is four months ago, had finished a, a uh, multifamily housing. It's just on Jefferson, just on the other side of Ramona. He was ready to open, and of course, a lot of your electrical transformers come on last and everything. He was told by the, the supplier it would be a 14-month lag before he could get that because of the deprivation of, of supply right now. He ended up finding one uh, in San Diego, which he paid 50% more than he would have he had waited and all. So I believe the reason I bring that up is, is that... Uh, we have a great challenge coming for us. CWASI doesn't matter. Uh, I think they're doing it. I think the negotiations with the trades will be very favorable and they're, they're Riversiders as well. But um, we're going to be challenged on, it's, we have 190 million. We don't have a drawer where we're hiding any. We, we can't use education funds for construction and so on and so forth. So, and of course, when we, measure row out to the voters uh, it and they have approved 70 percent uh, I commend them all uh, our study showed that the district needed 1.4 billion in uh, in funds to, for modernization and also because we prioritized uh, uh, community schools neighborhood schools at Casablanca East side and then we have the high Grove school which the state will help on all of those but you know we got the point four, but the billion's still there. So, like any family that needs to stretch their dollar, uh, we're going to have tough decisions to make, and we need to be prepared for it. And this won't be the first time. Lastly, on project team, and I, and I know my good friend Dale is just as passionate as I am about that wonderful campus. But was the ten million the projected budget? That was the, before it was bid out, is that right? Or did you have earlier uh, estimations? Yes, back in, in October 2021, it was the initial stages of the project. There was no project, it was more in eight of, of uh, the preliminary schematics. So it was our initial rough estimates. Right, um, right. Uh, but again, as you've seen things, as they go into engineering, things change. And at, uh, over you know, yeah. several years ago, uh, escalation has hit us very hard. Well. Congratulations to you and your staff for doing the best you can and finding the money, Ms. Power, as well, uh, because uh, as my, my colleague said, I, I have a great passion for project team. I think it's one of the most beautiful things in this district. And I will, uh, I know you'd like to move, sir, and I would be glad to second, Dr. Frug, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Trustee Kinnear and Trustee Hunt for raising those points. And uh, we do have a state bond on the ballot next year that's being developed as we speak, and those potentially those funds would be very important right now. Uh, we, do we have a motion from you, Trustee Kinnear? Move to approve. Motion Second, by Dr. Frugge. Can I have a clarification? This is for the remaining items on the consent. This is for the remaining items, okay. correct. Uh, and Trustee Hunt, second it. Please vote. Okay. The motion carries unanimously. So, uh, believe it or not, the next agenda item is actually the first normal business that agenda we have even though I know it's been a, a long wait for our, uh, our guests here from STEAM Academy uh, the <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you for your patience. This really is actually the first uh, standard item that we have. Uh, so the board will now hold a public hearing on the charter renewal petition submitted by REACH Leadership STEAM Academy Charter School. And so I will open the public hearing at 8.39 p.m. During the public hearing, the charter petitioner and the public have the opportunity to express their comments concerning the proposed charter school renewal. The district board may ask clarifying questions of district staff, reach representatives and or speakers at the public hearing. The governing board shall consider the level of support for the charter renewal petition by teachers employed by the district, other employees of the district and parents. No action will be taken by the board today. The public hearing will begin with a brief presentation by district administration, Dr. 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 Daniel Sosa, assistant superintendent, TK12 instruction, and Christy Batchelder, director of curriculum and assessment. The presentation will be followed by Dr. Virgie Renti, executive director, founder of REACH. Dr. Renti and REACH will be permitted up to eight minutes for their presentation. Following, following REACH's presentation, members of the public who have submitted speaker request forms will be permitted to address the board regarding the proposed charter renewal. Uh, I do want to note, and this is by policy, uh, my understanding, the public hearings uh, do not exceed 30 minutes. That's, that's what I've been put here. Is that Chris Keeler? Is that our? It's okay. Okay. So just to re repeat so everyone can hear, my understanding is, is that 20 minutes for a public hearing is allotted for public comments and then 10 minutes for the presentation. Is that Right. The rest of the presentation is just estimated to be I see. Okay. But it, it is 20 minutes for public comment on that this topic. Correct. Okay. So uh, we will turn it over to Dr. Sosa to give the report before we begin the public comments. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Thank you very much. If the team could bring up the presentation, please. Perfect. Thank you. As you were mentioning, we are here to... I'll just do a brief introduction. Thank you, Board President Farouk. I'd like to take a few moments just to provide a very brief background on REACH. REACH Leadership STEAM Academy has been in operation since September of 2012. Dr. Virgie Renti is the Executive Director, CEO, and founder of the school. Their current location is on Ruston Avenue, just west of UCR's campus. They currently serve grades TK through six. Now I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Christy Batchelder, director, director of Curriculum and Assessment. She will provide a few important technical elements of this process. And then as Dr. Freak was mentioning, we will have Dr. Renty come and share as well. So Ms. Batchelder. Good evening. If we can move to the next slide. We're just going to be orienting you to the renewal this evening for REACH Leadership STEAM Academy. According to this renewal timeline, the petition for renewal was submitted on March 31st, 2023. We are currently going through a multidisciplinary review of their petition for renewal. Today, we are holding the public hearing to hear from public related to supporting that petition for renewal. Um, Dr. Virgie Renti will present her regular annual update to the board on June 8th. We will post any findings and recommendations publicly on June 14th, and the board will give its decision on June 29th. We are not making any decisions tonight. We're here just for a public hearing to hear all of the information from REACH. We have guidance from our education code 47605 and 47607 here pursuant to California Ed Code section 47605B. The governing board of the school district shall hold a public hearing on the provisions of the charter, at which time the governing board of the district shall consider the level of support for the petition by teachers employed by the district, other employees of the district, and parents. 
Our renewal status currently for REACH is that they are qualified under a high tier status. Their current petition expires June 30th, 2024. According to the Ed Code listed there, all charter schools whose terms expire on or between January 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2025 shall have their term extended by two years. So REACH did have their petition, current petition expire within that time frame. So the June 30th, 2024 date is when that two years um, ends. So REACH is seeking renewal approximately a year early. They would typically come in the middle of next school year for their renewal, but they are here tonight to seek renewal. And based on their high tier status, they qualify for a five to seven year renewal and are requesting a seven year renewal from RUSD. The high tier definition is based on the fact that their scores are higher than the state average. Okay, I I, I know you guys are very passionate about this, but please uh, we want to make sure please allow the speakers to, to talk. Thank you. This is including the majority of their subgroups, and this is indicated by the two years preceding their renewal, the renewal decision, so 2019 and 2022. The renewal considerations are that we are making sure that the petition is updated to reflect any changes to law since the last renewal. Um, there are informational updates related to current operations of the charter school and that we ensure accuracy of the information contained in the petition. At this time, I will turn over to Dr. Virgie Renti to share a summary of the renewal petition from REACH Leadership STEAM Academy. I won't be here long, it's okay, They're, we're excited. So um, good afternoon, good evening, Dr. Farouk, um, Superintendent Hill and distinguished members of the board. I'm Virgie Renti, I'm the Executive Director of REACH Leadership STEAM Academy. Very happy to be here this afternoon. Um, we are here, I am here actually on behalf of our amazing teachers our scholars, our parents, our board, seeking a charter renewal for another seven years. Um, so I wanted to give you a little history first. And so for those of you that may or may not know, we were authorized back in February of 2012. And we opened our doors in September of 2012 at the Mount Rubidoux Seventh-day Adventist Church. Two years later, we moved our facility to the Riverside Community Church. We were there two years. At that point, we had to split campuses because we had outgrown our facilities. In 2027, we moved our entire campus over to the Grace United Methodist Church. And so as you can see, for the last 10 years of our existence, we've moved quite a bit. So we have now been at the Grace Community Church for uh, the last five years, and which has created quite a bit of stability for us. Um, in addition to moving facilities, we have also um, grown quite a bit. So in our first year, we served t uh, TK through second grade, and we now serve grades six uh, TK through six. We are a single site charter school. Um, presently, um, we are independently operated, and we currently are in our 10th year of operation, and the school has basically reached capacity with a waiting list in most grade levels. We wanted to highlight our diversity and just point out um, just a little bit of a difference, or sometimes a huge difference, between um, REACH and uh, the district and state. And just wanted to highlight just, again, um, the diversity that we have been able to um, take advantage of at REACH because we don't have borders and because we're a charter school and, and students can come in from various areas. We have um, almost 20% of our scholars are African-American compared to the district's 6% uh, average. And we're looking at two or more races of, of students. Um, we're also looking at a higher percentage at 7.5% versus 2% in the district. In terms of enrollment of um, students from uh, lower socioeconomic, dis uh, our lower income students, our English learners and our students with disabilities. Um, you'll see that since um, we have data from 2017 until now, we've continued to see an increase um, in those scholars on our campus with um, a little over 54% uh, of our students from low income families. 
We've also seen a significant increase um, for, uh, with students, uh, students with disability from 6% in 1718 to um, almost 10% in 2223. Here's a little bit of dashboard data, and I just wanted to point out just a few points. Um, this slide will come up in another presentation as well. And so here what we're showing is a snapshot from 2018, 2019, 2022. I mean, we're looking at SBAC data for language arts as well as math. What's important to note here is the continued growth, obviously, of our scholars and how well they've done over the course of the years, but also the comparison between reach and state data. So you'll see in English language arts, we can look at the, the column to the right in 2022. Um, our scholars were 17.3 points uh, above standard compared to the, the state's 12.2 points below the standard. And in math, um, although REACH as well as the district and state are below standard, um, our scholars are closer to the standard at 19 points in 2022 compared to a 51.7 points away from standard, um, the state in 2022. Um, and so we're looking at, uh, again, those different comparisons. I will touch on EL progress, English learner progress, absenteeism, and suspension in a later, in a later slide. This particular um, dashboard data is the same data, but just a different way of looking at it. And so if you look at English language arts, on the right, we're looking at 2018, 2019, 2022 data. We're comparing uh, reach to the far left, district in the middle, state on the right. And so the, fir the first uh, graph, obviously, on the left-hand side is language arts, math, on the right side, and you will see um, distance from the standard. You can see the REACH data 2018, um, 19, and 22 has been in language arts above standard with a significant increase in 2022 um, compared to the district and state that are um, below standard. Um, in mathematics, we're noticing that both REACH state and the district are performing below the standard in mathematics, but as you can see um, consistently from 2018, 19, and 2022, REACH has continued to um, uh, outpace the district and state with regards to um, uh, closing that gap um, as it relates to math and the standards um, there on that graph as well. This is another way to look at the data, and although there's a lot of points there, I just wanted to point out the trajectory uh, trending upwards. And so you'll see on the left-hand side, in language arts, we're meeting and exceeding the standards. All of our subgroups are trending upward, and this is um, from 2018 to 2022. In math, um, in the middle, um, we're seeing the majority of REACH scholars trending upward for all student groups. That includes African-Americans, uh, low-income students with disabilities, et cetera, all trending upward. And then um, obviously, and as well as on the fifth grade science test, meeting or exceeding standards, we see like a very steep increase um, looking at data from 2019 to 2022. All of our scholars continuing to trend upward. Here we're looking at suspension data, and I know we talked about suspension and, and, and that there's been a topic around that tonight. And so one of the things that we look at is restorative justice practices and how we can keep kids in school learning. And so you'll see if we, um, on the horizontal axis, we're looking at reach the state, a district in the middle, and then the state um, averages. And uh, you will see from our low income or EL students with disability, African American students. And you can see that REACH suspends less overall. And again, our idea is to keep kids in skeets learning. And we have other practices in which we address um, behavioral issues to, again, keep scholars um, on campus as often as possible. I'm looking at dashboard data again, and we're looking at our English learner progress. So we have fewer than 30 uh, students that um, fall in this category. So we see, uh, we saw a fluctuation this past year, but in full disclosure, we wanted to bring this data as well. So you can look and um, reach, obviously, on the left, district in the middle, state on the right. Um, in 2019, reach scholars were at 84% achieving uh, progress toward 
English language proficiency, and we saw a drop um, last year with that in that data down to 38%. We're going to see some fluctuation because the numbers are low, but we want you to know that we're also tracking that data to ensure that those scholars are making adequate progress. Also wanted to show English, reclass, uh, English learner reclassification rates. Again, REACH has traditionally outperformed district and state in this area. We did in 2021 zero reclassification. Um, however, again, we're tracking that data and we, can, um, we have a, a significant number of scholars that will reclassify this year. So we are watching and we're tracking that as well. We also, last but not least, in terms of data, we wanted to share with you that um, obviously chronic absenteeism is something that's plaguing us as well. And so we're looking at um, you know, a exponential increase three times the state, it looks like, in terms of chronic absenteeism. And REACH is no different, as a matter of fact, a little bit higher in terms of our scholars um, uh, needing that needing to be in their seats basically in that chronic, chronic absentee rate plaguing reach as well. So those are things that we're monitoring. We've put an attendance plan in place to address those issues. This is my final slide and I have, I jotted down a few points. I just wanted to bring them up before I get to this slide. So why and what and why are we here? So primarily we're here, we have a presumptive renewal on, and that's in part due to the hard work of our teachers and our staff and our scholars, and we're very, very proud of the work that they have done post-COVID. Um, and we know that we've been designated in a high-tier, high-performing charter school by the State Department of Education. And consistent with the Ed Code, it not only authorizes, uh, it all not only states that the authorizer should not deny our petition, but also it allows for a charter a seven-year renewal. So we are requesting seven years. And um, the reason why we're we're requesting seven years is that not only as a charter school consistently attain performance levels statewide that are higher than the average district and state but also in 2022, after the pandemic, all of our subgroups have received performance level higher than the state average. I also wanted to note here, and I jotted a few down, uh, like why seven years, why should we? Um, we wanted to just remind the district that we have a 10 year proven history with you all and a track record. And I decided to jot some things down. So we have had a clean audit for the last 10 years with no findings, a WASP accreditation with, uh, made it past WASP with flying colors, timely submission of all reports in the last 10 years, including any attendance reports, financial reports. Uh, we also have had, uh, we have a very welcoming and transparent school culture. Uh, a facility that remains in tip-top shape. We have strong community support, not only individuals outside, they're in your overflow. Yes, indeed. We also want to note that our scholars' performance on statewide assessments speaks to the rigor of um, instruction in our classrooms. So that being said, we urge you to please consider and renew our charter um, for another seven years so that we continue this legacy of diversity and closing the achievement gap for all of our scholars. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renti. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Renti. So I, I want to note to my colleagues that this is a public hearing, so we can, our role is only to ask clarifying questions if we have any uh, to the presentation, but it's, it's really to listen, uh, not to deliberate or probe uh, any broader questions. There will be other times for that. So I, I'd like to ask uh, respectfully to our, our staff in the back to put a counter for 20 minutes for public input. And uh, if they could please try to uh, pause it in between speakers uh, so that we can try to get to as many people as possible. We actually have... Why don't you do two minutes per Yes. We have uh, eight speakers, so if we give the normal uh, three minutes, it would be 24 minutes. How many do you we have? Because we... Are these... How many do you have? Eight. We've timed it. It's less than 20 minutes. 
Oh, you're, there's oh, anybody gotcha. from the public can, okay. can speak. Um, is, are we able to make a motion to allow the additional time? So if, if the colleagues are amenable, we could give each person three minutes? Uh, so, so moved, sir. Okay. So it's up to you guys if you want to exercise that, but you know, we, you've been patient and waiting. So we'll give, um, uh, we could just put it back to three minutes and we'll just do the normal standard amount. So uh, our first three minutes, oh, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, our first speaker is Mr. Kumamoto and <laughs> followed by Zahira Scott and Annette Templeton. I, I just want to say, please, I know you guys are very passionate, but we just want to keep the flow going. Uh, welcome, Mr. Kumamoto. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Thomas Kumamoto, and I have the pleasure of serving as the fourth grade math teacher here at REACH for the last two years. REACH is an amazing school. One of the things I think makes it so amazing is their focus on academic success through community. I remember my first year starting this school. I remember wondering as a new teacher, how was I going to fit in? How was I, the new guy, going to come with everyone else? Well, that answer was the house system for, these, for them. This system, I believe, is one of the best contributors towards our academic success. When students are here for the first time, they are given a house. As staff, we get to choose houses based on our own personalities. Each house is given a core value that we instill inside of our students, such as service, leadership, gratitude, responsibility, resilience, and excellence. Students earn points for their houses through both physical competition in the house games, but also through in the classroom through exhibition of these core values and also in high academic achievement. This dynamic, I believe, gives students a sense of belonging, equity in their education, and can alleviate stresses for new students. Because it's dynamic, I believe students are able to get acclimated in quickly, and they're able to stay focused, and they're bought in on their learning. Another reason that made REACH so great was that we as teachers never stop learning. There is no moment for us where we go, we have arrived. We ask the absolute best from our students, but we also as teachers know that we must contribute the best every single day. From daily planning to our many data meetings, we screen every resource to make sure everything that we are doing can support these students on every level. Our strong emphasis on professional development means there's always something more we can do as teachers to further these scholars. REACH, I believe, is a place where the sky is truly the limit for our students. They can be themselves. They know they are both loved and supported, not only by us teachers, but the staff at large. Lastly, we are a school of leadership. I love telling my students when I teach math, I'm not teaching nine and 10 year olds. I'm teaching future engineers, scientists, CEOs, CFOs, financial gurus, and perhaps even board members. This means we must equip them with the right mindset and academic tools to make them successful, not only to navigate through REACH, but also through college. I'm so grateful and I'm so blessed to teach here, and I look forward to many more years and a possible expansion into our middle school where we can further support Riverside Unified and your mission. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak here tonight, and I urge you, the board, to grant this seven-year renewal and material revision, which would allow us not only to continue to serve in our elementary capacity, but also expand into middle school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumamoto. Our next speakers are Zahira Scott, followed by Roy Blechert, followed by Ned Temple Templeton. Welcome, Ms. Scott. You have three minutes. Hi, I'm Zahira Scott, and I'm a volunteer at REACH Leadership STEAM Academy and mother of three, two of which attend REACH. I would like to express my support for the seven-year charter renewal and material revision for the middle school expansion of REACH. My children have attended REACH since March of 2022, and in that year, I have seen a school dedicated to turning children not only into academic scholars, but also world leaders. With their commitment to a, diver a diverse student population, as well as diverse faculty and staff, children of all backgrounds and cultures are given a safe and inclusive learning environment. They are encouraged daily to grow and learn from each other. As a parent who promotes empathy and acceptance of others, I am reassured those values are reinforced at school. The education my children are receiving at REACH is outstanding. I have two scholars attending, who are completely different and REACH has been able to cater to their individual needs. As a volunteer at REACH, I have seen firsthand the amount of time and thought that goes into everything they do. 
Whether it is a learning assembly or house competitions, the effort they put into creating a fun learning, learning environment is unmatched. While volunteering, I had the privilege of accidentally listening in on a leadership class, and I tell everyone who will listen how moving and powerful it was. The 30-minute commute to school every day is worth it, knowing this is the education my children will receive. I look forward to seeing what they have in store for the middle school. Thank you for your time, and I strongly urge you to renew the charter for Reach Leadership STEAM Academy, as well as accept the material revision for the middle school expansion. Please allow them to continue building our children into the leaders and scholars they were always meant to become. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Our next speakers are Roy Brecher, followed by Annette Templeton, followed by Malika Bratton. Welcome, Mr. Blackheart. You have uh, three minutes. The young lady's presentation sure blew the stereotypes right out the window. You look at the achievement rates that's coming up and the students that are doing that, and that'll be exactly what the rhetoric is that's been going on. What this board should be doing, you should be every day before the next school year ends for the next whatever it is, six weeks, you should be having study sessions, hearings, finding out why these kids are enthusiastic about it going to the school, why these teachers want to go to their school and teach the kids that are going to be the leaders of the, of the 21st century. You should be looking at not only renewing this charter for seven years, it should be renewed for 70 years. This is a failure of leadership. What's going on in here? Mr. Sergio can say that. I said this back in 17 when he was working at the crime syndicate. You should be working on the facilities and teachers and stuff that are going to do this. This is why you had the first two hours, Mr. Farouk, of what was going on because of the failure. It was not only here, all across the board. Look at California was number one in education in 1990. Now we're down at the bottom because we didn't follow the model of what you see standing behind me here. What we need to do, what we should be doing, our obligation is to make sure 100% that we are being honest that we will hear, that we will attend. We're enthusiastic about attending what the public hears. We want to hear what the public hears. Not how we can limit the public. We don't want to hear them. That's what we just heard. You're trying to stifle. We wouldn't have heard that teacher if you had your way coming up here. And that is wrong. 100%. And for you to sanction that and put him in charge of this as president to lead that, that's a reflection on all of you. So as we work through this process, hopefully we'll come together. Hopefully we'll take this energy and enthusiasm of education and push it all over the country because that's what we need. Okay, our next speakers are Annette Templeton, followed by Malika Bratton, followed by Alam Geet. Ms. Templeton? Welcome, you have three minutes. My name is Zaida Scott, once again, and I'm reading on behalf of Annette Templeton. My name is Annette Templeton. Wait, one moment. Mr. Keeler, is that... We don't, you don't read... We can have a written comment submitted uh, to, for the record. We will, we, will, we will receive those comments for the record. Thank you. Uh, our next speakers are Malika Bratton, followed by Alam Keith, followed by Julie Slusser. Hi. Dear board members, hello. 
My name is Alam Guy, and I'm a board member of Reach Leadership Steam Academy for the past seven years, a proud parent of six students who's been attending, graduated and still attending as well, and I'm a community member. As a dedicated board member, I am here today to express my strong support for the renewal for, of the Charter of REACH Academy for the next seven years. I had the privilege of being involved with REACH since it first opened its doors. And I can say without hesitations, it's an exceptional school that offers the student a safe and an outstanding learning environment. And honestly, after today's board meeting, I didn't know that we were sheltered in a box and I wanna thank all the staff and Dr. Renty for offering us a safe learning environment and a safe mental health environment for our children. So thank you all. One of the things that sets Reach apart from other schools is the commitment to diversity. As a board member, I have first seen firsthand the importance of this commitment to creating a truly inclusive and welcoming environment for students of all backgrounds. As a parent, I have experienced the benefits of this diversity in my own children's education. The school embraces of diversity has helped my children develop a deeper understanding and appreciation of other cultures and perspective. I also want to emphasize that I drive 35 minutes each way to drive my kids and I am gonna do it continuously after tonight's meeting. So thank you, Reach, Woo. please renew us. <laughs> Um, furthermore, REACH has a strong focus on creativity, innovation, encouraging students to think outside the box and approach problems in a new and innovative ways. The teachers are dedicated and passionate and have worked tirelessly to ensure that each student reaches their full potentials. I love our teachers. In summary, I urge the Board of Education to renew REACH membership, leadership for the next seven years. I mean, membership, we don't have it, but yeah, leadership for the next seven years. As a board member, parent, and a member of the community, I have first seen firsthand the exceptional education and learning e environment that REACH provides. Thank you for your consideration, and thank you for the parents for being here to support us tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Malika Bratton, followed by Julie Slusser, closed by my, my Urlin... Abak, am I pronouncing that right? Sorry. Is Malika here? No. Okay. Is she? You said Malia. Malika Bratton. That's okay. Julie Slusser. Is is Julie here? Malia's here. Did you say Malia? It says Malika, but I, with a K. Yeah, Malika Bratton. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Julie. Uh, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Julie Slusser and I am a parent and volunteer at REACH Leadership Academy. My son and goddaughter have the privilege of attending REACH and I've had many opportunities to observe how they are growing and being supported in their academic studies by the community of teachers, staff, peers, and volunteers at REACH. Every day the focus for each child is on gaining leadership skills and confidence through continuous improvement and personal growth, not just test scores. There is a growth mindset Every child can improve with effort and support. Our children are not just students, they are scholars who are building the foundation of their future through academic excellence and critical thinking. This focus on the future ingrains an understanding that the effort that you put in now and the choices you make have a direct line to future success. REACH is structured to allow every scholar to succeed and provides academic and community resources to support that success. When determining where our son should go to school, one of the most impactful tenets of the REACH mission was the focus on restorative justice. Discipline at REACH is not focused on punishment, but on prevention and community building. This is a holistic practice that builds trust and empathy and strengthens skills relevant to social and emotional learning, communication with peers and teachers, and problem solving. With this focus on community, no child is on their own. They have the support of the teachers and staff, but they also have a group of their peers that they support and learn from with the schoolhouses. This model promotes a positive school culture and fosters camaraderie and belonging as it focuses on the six core values, leadership, excellence, responsibility, resilience, service, and gratitude. 
Scholars stay with their house throughout their time at REACH and build lasting relationships with their peers. This foundation of community will serve our scholars for the rest of their lives. Currently, this is only possible through sixth grade. A middle school expansion is an important way that REACH can support the Riverside community at this time. This is a time of transition for our scholars. Change, changes in maturity, social acceptance, and personal growth all happen at this age. Giving them academic and social continuity at a REACH middle school will help solidify the values and skills that they have learned during their time with the REACH Academy and allow for a smoother and more supportive transition during this period of uncertainty and change. REACH has proven their ability to provide a strong foundation for our children and would continue that excellence with the renewal of their charter and the middle school expansion. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our last public comment is from Mayurlin Abak. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Are they here? M A Y U R. Oh, she is here. She's here. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. For, for Thank you so much. My name is Mayurlin Abak, Welcome. and I am glad I stayed. <laughs> Apparently, some of us have children that are way past their bedtime. I just want to address the board today and thank you guys for listening to us. You can see that everyone is invested, everyone from parents, teachers to community leaders. I am a proud parent of a fifth grader that goes to the school that has been going since kindergarten. And I cannot speak more words than everyone else has already said in accordance to how we feel about the school. My daughter had an incident not too long ago, two weeks ago. We lost a kitten at the house and she was completely devastated and didn't tell me about it, went to school. Her teacher right away noticed that she was very emotionally distraught over this, um, what happened. She's clearly still 11 years old, so she didn't know how to cope with those feelings. Her teacher right away looked at it and said, you know what, you, you would want to go speak to our counselor and decided to send her in. And she spoke to the counselor and when she came home, she told me, Mom, I feel so much better. I didn't know how to talk to you about it. I thought it was just no big deal, but I didn't realize how much it was going to affect me. At school, I couldn't focus, but I went to go speak to our counselor, and she helped me through my feelings. And now I feel like I could move on from this. And when she told me that, I was completely shocked because I didn't even know that there was something going on with her. She seemed like a normal child, like all parents here have our kids. We go through the motions of everyday routines didn't realize it and I proud myself in talking to her and wanting to know what's going on, but yet I still miss this tiny little detail of what was going on in her life at that moment. And I could only say how proud and grateful I am to the teachers, to the staff that put together this program because then my 11 year old was able to go through and get the help that she needed at that moment and continue on with her day and hopefully move on. And now she will probably learn how to deal with things like this moving on in her life as she goes through middle school and high school, which is the reason why I'm here to support today for this middle school to get reopened and get everything going for her so my daughter could have that opportunity. Thank you so much for your time and have a good night. Thank you. That concludes our public comments, and I just want to acknowledge from staff, it's my understanding that uh, this is only for clarifying questions related to what was presented, but we, the board will have an opportunity, ample opportunity, to provide broader comments and, uh, and questions, inquiries at our next meeting when there is actually a fo formal vote on this matter. Is that m correct? The next meeting will be Reach's annual update. And okay. In the, but in the annual update, we can ask deeper questions and have a broader engagement. So unless it's a clarifying question, Trustee Hunt, do you have any? Dr. Rintik, I, first I want to compliment the staff superintendent on what is a, the best review of a charter school that I've ever on my time up here. And I commend all of you, Dr. Sosa as well. Uh, Dr. Rennie, always good to see you. Just help me on a few things. What is your classroom size? The average size is about 28. 28, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, well, I guess, I guess we'll talk about it next time. How many of, of your population know you pull from a lot of areas, as the young lady said? Because uh, you and I, when we first met, great vote that I made then, uh, and you've done more than fulfill my admission about providing for the east side. But 
how many of your students of your total population you feel are coming from the local neighborhood, east side, et cetera? And um, unfortunately, we don't track that data any longer, oh. so I'm not able to, to, to tell. I mean, we can try to look at our ARIES data and, and get back with you on that, but I don't have the data. Well, you're making a difference, so I, but I would love to know that because, as you and I talked about then, that was a strong reason I, I advocated for you all. Well, we'll pull the, um, the zip codes, and, and when I present on the 8th, I'll, I'll bring that information for you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Reed. Thank, thank you. Dr. Thank you, Trustee Allen. We'll have, like, like I said, uh, ample opportunity to have an open-ended discussion on all those matters uh, at the next meeting. So th thank you uh, for a great uh, presentation and public hearing. Uh, so I will adjourn our public hearing at 9.19. But now oh. we're going to open up another uh, one of regarding the material revision. So. The board will now hold a, a public hearing on the material revision petition. I'm opening this one at 920, submitted by REACH Leadership STEAM Academy, concurrent with the renewal petition. REACH is seeking a material revision to add grades 7 and 8 and a second facility. At this time, uh, like I mentioned, I'm opening this public hearing. Uh, and during this hearing, the charter petitioner and the public have the opportunity again to express their comments concerning the proposed material revision. The district board may ask clarifying questions of district staff, reach representatives, and or speakers at the public hearing. The governing board shall consider the level of support for the proposed material revision by teachers employed by the district, other employees of the district, and parents. No action will be taken by the board today. The, board, the public hearing will begin with a brief presentation by district administration. Again, Dr. Daniel Sosa, Assistant Superintendent, TK through 12 instruction, and Christy Batchelder, Director of Curriculum and Assessment. That presentation will be followed again by Dr. Virgie Renti, Executive Director and Founder of REACH. Dr. Renti and REACH will be permitted up to eight minutes for their presentation. Following REACH's presentation, members of the public who have submitted speaker request forms for this specific item will be permitted again to address the board regarding the uh, uh, proposed material revision. It says here the public hearing shall be no longer than 30 minutes in total. We will begin with Dr. Sosa, District Administration. Thank you so much, Dr. Farouk. And just a couple of uh, points of clarification. Just as we did last time, the board could choose to uh, go longer with public comment. That is at your discretion. Uh, and another point of clarification for, uh, for the public and for those here in attendance today, the education code requires that because there is a material revision, there is a change being requested to the uh, charter that is in place, that these be held as two separate public hearings, one for the renewal, one for the material revision. That's why we are doing it in this way to comport with the education code. So if we can bring the presentation up, that would be great. Perfect. And as I did previously, I'll just provide a brief introduction. Again, this is for REACH Leadership STEAM Academy. They've been in operation, as Dr. Renty shared, since September of 2012. For the material revision, they are proposing to expand to, uh, from grades TK6 to grades 7 through 8. They will need a new location in order to do this, as Dr. Renty will share when she comes uh, up to share the why behind why they're asking for the material revision. Just as we did last time, I'll invite Ms. Christy Batchelder to come and provide the board and community with the specifics and the ed code citations as to uh, how the process will go to review the material revision. Thank you very much. Orienting us to material revision as, as Dan Sosa shared, these are two separate actions that the board will take, renewal and material revision. Again, this is the same timeline I shared the last, um, when we were presenting on renewal. We are actively engaging in the multidisciplinary review process of the material revision and the petition that was submitted on March 31st. We will enter a decision and present that to the board on June 29th. The guidance from education code related to material revision also falls with 47605 and 47607. 
pursuant to California Education Code 47605A4, sorry, the A should have been there, after receiving approval of its petition, a charter school that proposes to expand operations to one or more additional sites or grade levels shall request a material revision to its charter and shall notify the chartering authority of those additional locations or grade levels. The chartering authority shall consider whether to approve those additional locations or grade levels at an open public meeting. If the additional locations or grade levels are approved pursuant to the standards and criteria described in subdivision C, they shall be a material revision to the charter school's charter. So I will go over the overview of what constitutes a material revision. Chain, any change to location or grade levels being served constitutes a material revision. Also things such as a change in governance structure or significantly increasing or decreasing enrollment, changing the educational program, or changing retirement system for school employees. In this case, the request is to change the current campus from TK6 to seek an additional an adding of grades seven and eight. So this would shift um, the campus, the current campus would host TK through five. Sixth graders would shift over to a proposed second campus and then the request would be to extend those grades to include seventh and eighth. So sixth through eighth being held at a second location to be ha added um, this middle school site along West Linden Street. And I know that Dr. Renty will share more about that. In analysis of material revision, we want to assure alignment with the charter elements, it, the impact to staffing, the budget, budget and facilities, that it serves the entire community and the fiscal impact. So I will share with you the considerations. The process will follow the same timeline as renewal. When we receive the petition, it follows that same process because they were both submitted together. RUSD is currently conducting that multidisciplinary review. RUSD board will grant approval or denial of material revision separate from renewal. And I will invite Dr. Renty up to share her summary of the material revision petition for REACH. All right, I'm back to um, go over the presentation and the request for material revision. Um, so the why and the what, and so we're seeking a re material revision um, to our existing charter requesting to add 7th and 8th, as Christy has stated. Um, we would like to continue this legacy of providing a college preparatory, STEAM-focused educational program within the Riverside community. Um, we are making a difference, and we've shown through our data that all student groups achieve, have achieved academic performance levels that have exceeded state standards post the pandemic. Um, for example, our African American students have performed 13.51% higher in ELA and over 8% higher in mathematics. Our Asian, Asian scholars have performed at a 6.55%. Uh, points higher in ELA and over 3% higher, percent higher in mathematics. Uh, for our low-income scholars, we're also seeing an increased rate of performance, higher 17.9% higher in ELA and over 20% higher in mathematics. Our English learners, 7%, almost 8% higher in math and slightly higher in ELA when we're comparing to statewide averages. So what is the need? So the REACH community, um, school community has expressed their desire and their, their, uh, for the school to go beyond uh, sixth grade. Not only our scholars, but also, not only our parents, but our students ask as well. So there are often times when sixth graders are promoting that ask, can they stay longer? So what we did, we thought we would put um, some data, uh, look, look at some data, and so we pulled, pulled our, our parents this spring and ask them um, for their, would they support a middle school expansion? And if we were to expand, would their scholars attend? And overwhelmingly, um, our parents said yes, with nearly 99% saying, if we put a middle school, they will come. And so um, 
we have been remarkably successful in preparing scholars to meet academic um, achievement goals, and we continue to outperform the district and state. And so we see that community need, and notably um, the charter school success in closing the achievement gap for students of color is something we would like to consider and to continue um, with this charter school expansion. Here's a look at that same dashboard data, and one of the things we wanted to point out here, just to drill down a little bit further, looking at English language arts and mathematics, um, we have seen, we compared the state um, with REACH in 2022. We also wanted to show REACH's um, and how much we've improved since 2018. So in 2018, in language arts, we were three points above standard. And after the pandemic, we were 17 points above standard. And again, that is a legacy that we would like to continue. As well as post-pandemic, we still see a closing of the gap in mathematics. This is a look again at the data that you saw earlier with all of our subgroups um, trend, trending upwards in language arts to the left. In the middle, most of our, if not all, almost all subgroups trending upward in math in the middle. And again, that um, steep slope in on the science test. So we took those, those graphs and we wanted to compare them to the state. And we're just looking visually at reach on the left, the state on the right, and you will see all subgroups again in ELA trending upward and we see a downward um, trend for the state post pandemic. So what that means again is all of our subgroups are continuing to trend upward and the state um, post pandemic, obviously there's a difference there. You'll see the same thing in, in math. And again, we just wanted to show the two comparisons side by side with reach on the left, the state on the right. And you see that again, in, an increase in performance for reach. And then um, when we're comparing to state data, again, we've seen that decline statewide after the pandemic. What we really wanted to drill down further before, we, um, before I'm done here was we wanted to look at the science test, the fifth grade science test um, this year. So when we wanted to also mention and state out loud, the REACH is meeting its goal of creating future leaders in the field of science and technology. So here on the fifth grade science test in 2022, the data shows that um, every demographic has benefited on this test by being at our school. So for instance, the total population all together at the top of the graph, you'll see um, outperform the state by nearly 30%. So we almost achieve, achieved a 60% um, met or exceeded on the cast. What's really exciting to see is our African-American scholars um, we're at 47% compared to the state's 13, almost 14%, a difference of over 30%. Our Hispanic or Latino scholars, 63, almost 64% um, met or exceeded on the cast versus 18% at the state. Our students with disabilities, we saw a slight decline, but our low income scholars, 54%. Um, passing rate on the science test in fifth grade compared to 18% at the state level, a difference of almost 36%. Switching hats here, looking for um, achievement data and just enrollment. This is just a quick slide just to kind of show um, what the trajectory is for enrollment. Looking at next year, still holding steady at a little over uh, 640 scholars as we will continue. Um, we don't add on the uh, seventh grade until 2024, so you'll start seeing the numbers trend upward, which is the total on the bottom. And then you'll see by year uh, 2028 is when the, student, the school is at capacity at that point. And so um, and from 2028 on, we're looking at um, a little over 950 students. Our staffing plan, because there is a teacher shortage, and so some of the things that we do at REACH is, um, first, firstly, in terms of middle school, um, we have um, existing teachers that have expressed a desire to uh, move up and teach at the middle school level. We also have a established a hiring process, and we train and equip um, some of the most qualified teachers on our campus. We also, um, our administration continues to create a pipeline for teachers, for them to learn and to go and grow and to train um, on our campus, which includes um, MOUs with surrounding school districts, I'm sorry, colleges and universities. 
um, where we allow students, uh, student teachers as well as interns um, to learn how learn their craft on our campus. And so one of the pipelines for our teachers, well, we have several, which is the student teachers, interns, we have residential subs that we also train, we have interventionists that are also training to become teachers, and if, if so desired, we have um, not only we have classroom aides as well as behavior interventionists that have shown expressed, expressed desires to teach um, at, um, at a higher level. In terms of a pipeline for administrators, it sort of goes like this. We start off with teachers, we then identify um, our team leads, which somehow is on, a, I don't know where it went on that slide, but team leads, and they go from team leads to instructional coaches, and as uh, assistant principal uh, positions open up, they can move into those spaces, and in the future, we're looking at adding principals. With regards to facility, because obviously that would be a question that I would think that you would have, um, we're currently uh, negotiating with the Form Evangelical Formosan Church, which is located on the corner of Linden and Iowa Avenue. This church is less than five miles from our existing campus. We could literally walk. And so we're in lease negotiations. We actually meet with them tomorrow. And um, in terms of the cost for the facility, the charter school is responsible for upgrades to the church site as it is at its current site. Um, we were looking to procure tax exempt bonds issued by the California State Finance Authority to fund the new project. We're looking at a projected bond amount from 18 to 22 million with a 40 year term. Continuing on with facility and financing, um, so we have shared a detailed financials with the district, um, but just currently we wanted to just state that we're looking at a, an operating loss in the fiscal year 25, which is the first year of the middle school of about 500,000. Um, cash flow in any given year, however, fluctuates between 200,000 and 2 million, and this is with the expansion. Our budget that we're looking at in the budget in the uh, proposal is a $23 million bond. And we've assumed um, an overall $1.4 million in lease costs, including the ground lease and bond payments. And then again, we're looking at a fund balance that ranges from 18% to 29% any given year. So on this chart, again, this has been submitted. I just wanted to, I wish I had a pointer, but I guess all, you all couldn't see it anyway. But I wanted to just point out a couple of things. So if you look at year three and we go down to operating income, well, first we'll start with um, revenue. So if we go to year one, we're looking at, which is this current year, we're looking at 9 million in revenue. Next year, it jumps up to about 11.2 million in revenue. And then you see in year nine, we're at 19.2, uh, I'm sorry, 17.2 million. I mentioned that there was an operating loss in year three. And so if we look at year three and we go down to operating income, you see a loss of about 500,000. However, if you continue down that column and you look at the end of the year fund balance, we have 2.4 million. So we have a reserve and that's what the reserve is for when you're having you know, one of those years. Um, however, so, there, so it doesn't impact um, our over at the overall fund balance. We're still looking at 18% reserve. Um, even after the loss in that first year. And so again, our fund balance and our reserve fluctuates between 18% to 29%, and we know that in public school, the recommendation is a 5% reserve. So the financials look pretty strong. So final thoughts, and again, I have a couple of little points. Is So we wanna continue obviously that legacy of diversity. As we stated that we have almost 20% of students on our campus that are African American. We have over 50% that are socially, economically disadvantaged, and we have a growing Asian population as well as all of our Muslim students on our campus. And so we're reaching all learners as has been evidenced by our data. Our suspension rates are lower, meaning that we are keeping scholars in school learning, working against that prison to school pipeline due to Reach's restorative practices. Um, our scholars achieved nearly 60% proficiency rate, as we've stated, um, on the statewide test in ELA, as well as math scores outpacing the district and the state. And so again, we see this as a win-win proposition, not only for Reach, for our scholars, for our parents, for teachers and staff, also for, our, for the district as well as surrounding districts. Um, 
because we feel like we have demonstrated our ability to change the academic tra trajectory for all students. And a middle school expansion will allow us to continue our legacy of restorative practices and creating future leaders. And we just ask that you would grant this petition for expansion. And in so doing, it will allow us to help not only RUSD, but our surrounding districts in preparing our scholars for high school, college, and beyond. And so we thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rennie, for that great presentation. Uh, Trustee Hunt, uh, these are the public input uh, regarding this item of consideration for addition of grades seven and eight and the additional school location. So uh, there's 13 cards, which is within like 10 minutes of the overall time frame. That's, if that's amenable to all of you. We'll do the, the standard amount. Uh, so if we could put three minutes on the clock, uh, our first Sure. I don't know which ones are the students. Okay, Malia. Malia Lau. Welcome, Malia. You have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Malia Kao, and I'm a fourth grader here at Reach Leadership STEAM Academy. I came to Reach in 2021 as a brand new third grader. I had no idea why my mom would make me switch schools, but after two years here at Reach, I finally understand. At my old school, all students were kept at the same academic level for their grade because there was no support for advanced students. I was never challenged and would often get bored. Here at REACH, learning is individualized. I've been able to reach new academic goals and have been given opportunities for advanced learning throughout the year. Mr. Kumamato is my homeroom and math teacher. He has made such a fun and positive classroom environment that makes me excited and ready to start the day. Miss Judy is my leadership teacher. She teaches us important life skills that I will be able to carry on as I grow. We learn how to build confidence, step out of our comfort zones, and push ourselves to keep working hard. Rumor has it that Reach wants to keep growing and open a middle school. I would be so happy to be able to attend Reach Middle School knowing that my education and growth will continue to be supported. And of course, to stay connected to the amazing friendships I have made here. I am excited to see what these next few years at Reach will look like. And I hope Reach stays long enough so that one day even my own children may walk these school grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Dr. Renty, is there other students? Which, what, what, what's, your, what's your name? Savannah. Oh, Savannah. Okay, I have that. Thank you. Savannah, please proceed. Hi, my name is Savannah Sterling, and I've been here at REACH since the age of four, and now I'm currently in fifth grade. I've enjoyed my time here at REACH, and I'm excited to move on to sixth grade soon. One thing I love about the REACH staff is they're so kind and always fulfill our needs. I love this school because Dr. Renty and admin are always open to ideas. For example, a fifth grade scholar had an idea to use hand dryers in the restrooms instead of paper towels because it would be more efficient. And now we have hand dryers. On top of that, admin always greets us in the morning with smiles. They help us build confidence, encourage us, and treat us like scholars. I also like how they treat our opinions. For example, where the playground is, it used to be just a big sandpit. A lot of us play soccer on the field, and now we have a whole soccer team that I am happily on. Also, I love that we have spring performance. Spring performance is when we sing, dance, or both, which we had a couple weeks ago, and I was proudly an MC. I hope you will renew our school and make it possible for a new middle school that I hope I will go to. I've been here at Reachins Kinder, and I hope it could stay that way. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Dr. Renty, are there any other student speakers? Okay. So we'll proceed with the normal order then. Julie Slusser again? She went earlier. Okay. You had another one, so I just wanted to give you the option. So you defer them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next one is Michelle Kinsman, followed by Monique Tyner, followed by Adriana Olag. 
Uh, it's Michelle Kinsman, Moni Tyner. I hope I'm pronouncing these names right. Adriana Olegvi. Welcome, welcome, Michelle. You have three minutes. Thank you so much. I love that I was getting shown up by all of these elementary students, right? Like, literally, they're going to put me to shame, and I love it. If I was going to reach an elementary, I might be doing a better job up here. So I am a parent of a third grade scholar. Actually, strike that. I am a proud parent of a third grade scholar at REACH. My daughter began her scholastic career at REACH in kindergarten. It was fall of 2019. From the onset, our family has been impressed by the dynamic, diverse curriculum and engaged, dedicated teachers. Additionally, we are appreciative of the supportive staff and administrative team. <laughs> REACH has given my daughter the opportunity to excel. They have accommodated my daughter's needs and have worked to provide a safe, nurturing environment. While surrounding schools struggled at the onset of COVID, REACH students were given support and educational interaction within a week following the shutdown. It was unheard of, and we appreciated it so much, and it made a crucial difference in her life and the lives of all these students, I'm sure. My daughter relishes their house system, which helps to promote bonds between students outside of their immediate classmates in a friendly, competitive forum. She enjoys the celebration of culture and differences REACH embraces. My daughter, much like her classmates, has been taught to set and obtain goals, to be resilient, and to look towards her future. She's been grounded a solid foundation. I would like to see that continued. One of my concerns as a parent is facing the question of where my daughter will continue her education after her sixth grade year. A change in program style would complicate matters. Additionally, quite a few REACH parents commute, which ultimately means my daughter will have few familiar faces to ease that already challenging transition. I would like my daughter, as well as her classmates, to have the opportunity to continue to excel in the REACH program building up our children and giving them the tools and support to grow into strong, valued members of our society should be the goal of our community. Accordingly, I ask the RUSD board to renew the charter petition with the material revision for middle school expansion. Please allow my daughter to keep her family, her REACH family, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Hunt, Trustee Hunt, did you ask, do you have a clarifying question? You made a request to speak. Okay. Our next speakers are Moni Tyner, followed by Adriana Olegve, and followed by, okay. Followed by Christina Brisley. Moni, welcome. You have three minutes. Hi. Uh, my name is actually Moni Tyner. Oh, I'm, I'm apologies. Moni That's okay. So my name is Monet Tyner. I'm actually here to represent um, the Bozeman children who are not here tonight because they are involved in other activities. Um, so I had a speech plan, but I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to basically say that what's understood does not have to be explained. The fact that you see all these people here at 947 um, <laughs> and you have kids that are willing to come up here and speak speaks volumes. Unfortunately, our voices were not heard by everybody who was up here complaining for three to four hours um, and attacking your board. Um, as you can see, there's really nobody up here that's doing that because we're not here to do that. We're here to basically say, listen, our kids deserve to have a safe place. They deserve to be wanted. They deserve to be loved. And understanding that all these kids come from different backgrounds. Um, speaking for my children, I am a single mother of three kids that works three jobs. I go to school full time. Um, and, you know, when my kids came to reach, we were a broken family. We were really broken. Um, and I found out about reach through other people. But when my kids came here, they said, mom, I don't care where we go to school. We just want to actually be in a classroom. So, um, when my, my son Noah Bozeman came, um, in January of 2021, and then my daughter Anaya Bozeman, who's going to be promoting, um, in a few weeks, she came right after him. And so now that my daughter has to go to uh, Vista Heights Middle School, 
which there's no shame on that, but I'm very nervous for her to enter into a place where there are fights every single day, where teachers are completely complaining about their jobs. Um, and so I feel that students should not have to feel like they are a burden to the school districts. Um, and unfortunately, that's how they feel. But when they're at reach, they don't feel that way. And parents don't feel that they're burdens either. Um, our voices are heard. And as parents, we take responsibility for our children where we support our, our teachers, our administrators, and all the staff that work um, for the school. Um, Dr. Renty obviously has provided a safe place for everyone to feel welcome. And I just feel that I know you guys are gonna approve her renewal. And I know you're gonna also approve her um, junior high school. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Adriana Olavi, Christina Bris Olavi, Olavi, Christina Bris Brisin, and then Adriana. Oh, I have two from the same one. It's just me, just one. Okay, thank you. Welcome, you have three minutes. Thank you. We actually left and then when we were live streaming it and my daughter realized that my speech wasn't gonna be heard, she's like, we gotta go back. So we took brother home, we dropped him off, we put him to bed and we're back. <laughs> so, uh, it is with great pride that I write this letter as a fifth year REACH parent. Our oldest started at REACH as a kindergartner and now is a thriving fourth grader that is truly eager for the middle school expansion. I've always been happy with the curriculum and education my children were receiving from REACH, but I was truly blown away with the extent REACH admin and teachers went during COVID. When my friend's children were getting packets, my kids were immersed in virtual learning. Many parents across the nation complained that they felt their children are behind not only academically, but also socially because of COVID, but I don't share that sentiment. REACH went above and beyond to make sure every student had access to a laptop to make virtual learning a possibility. The teachers kept enthusiasm and school spirit to an absolute high. REACH is committed to never leaving a student behind. They make an effort to provide students of all racial and economic backgrounds the same opportunities in a safe environment. My kids feel seen, loved, and above all, accepted by not only the staff, but also by their peers, which is a direct result of the environment REACH has created. For the first four years of our daughter attending REACH, we had to commute over an hour to get her to school each morning. We probably passed over a dozen other elementary schools on our route, but we knew that this small sacrifice would be worth the education she was receiving at REACH. We are very much looking forward to what REACH can do with the middle school and seeing how our children will continue to thrive. Our daughter tells us all the time that she wants to go to UCR so she can become a teacher at REACH one day. The investment REACH puts into our children today will undoubtedly be returned tenfold into future generations and communities. All of this to say, I strongly urge you to renew the charter for REACH Leadership Steam Academy, as well as accept the material revision for the middle school expansion. Please allow REACH to continue breathing life into our children that will one day become vital contributors to our world. Thank you, Adriana. Our next speakers are Christina Bussin, followed by Carla Sanchez, followed by Lo Roy Blackard. Christina Bussin. Welcome. W one moment. W one moment. Let's just get the clock. Okay. I'll take the extra seconds if you want me to. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so, I know you guys heard I, enough, so. I'm not sure what the, what the issue is. Okay, okay, please proceed. Thank you, Christina. Hello, everybody. My name is Christina Briseño, mom of three amazing kids in the back row. I just want to say thank you for taking the time to hear us out, and I apologize for all the craziness that's currently going on in this world. But one thing I do want to say is REACH is the only school that I've noticed that is creating an amazing foundation for our kids that aligns with our core values of, as our family. So not only do our kids walk in and they have to hand, they shake a hand and make eye contact, it's creating good traits for the future. So one thing that I noticed, my kids in first grade, third and fourth, and my kids all started there very young, my son as TK, and I really hope that this continues to grow because the structure that they're creating for students will help us avoid the craziness that you're going through in these high schools. So imagine if this structure continues from elementary to middle school, I can't even see the goals that Dr. Renty will put up for high school one day, which I hope it gets to that. 
because if not, I will be homeschooling high school students. I'm just saying. So it's one of those things that my son is, he's in first grade, first grade right now. My oldest, she's in fourth grade. In my third grader, she's receiving so much support now. I can just imagine what they'll be receiving in middle school. And not just that, our core values, if you notice all these parents behind us, it's crazy. It's not just a family, but the involvement that you don't see in high schools. And that's one of the things that a lot of people lack in their homes right now is parents that are active. A lot of these kids are turning to social media and the society that's out there and all these posts to create an environment for them, to create structure that they can turn to for people to look, to, look up to. The second my student, my kids walk on campus, they have good examples in front of them. They have teachers that are waiting there and they have an amazing discipline program. Miss Judy, yes, I know about you. <laughs> So my, my kids know that at, mom, at home, they deal with mom, and at school, they deal with Miss Judy. So I love it. I love it because not only do they continue this strict and organized structure at home, but they continue at school so they can just pick up when I pick them up at 3 o'clock, we pick up where we left off. And I just want to say thank you, and I really do hope you consider this because this would be a great example to maybe you can take tips from them or we can have Miss Do Dr. Renty go to other schools or show kind of a program to see what we can do to involve those or maybe even do some kind of involvement with other schools so they can get a little bit of reach because at the end of the day it's our heart and soul that pours into our kids and I just I love my kids so much and I can't see them going to one of these schools that are getting focused on things that really shouldn't matter when we should be focusing on developing them now and not worrying about things going on but thank you <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Our next speakers are Carla Sanchez, followed by Roy Bleckert, followed by Sean Ruiz. Welcome, Carla. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, esteemed board members. Uh, my name is Carla Sanchez, and I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Reach Leadership STEAM Academy. I, I've seen many, many of you and met many of you before. Um, I've been an educator at Reach for the past 10 years, spending a majority of that time teaching fifth and sixth grade. Uh, being a sixth grade teacher is bittersweet. It's exciting to work with young people who have great ideas, big hearts, and are developing into people they want to be in the future. However, it's also difficult saying goodbye at the end of year, wishing you just had a little more time time with them. Anyone who visits REACH, many board members included, always speak about the energy, the joy, and they love the love they feel when they're on our campus. And the reason you feel this is because of the community that we have created. And many of our middle schoolers or sixth graders who move on, when they're on break, they come to volunteer at our school because they miss that community and they want to see us again. And I don't know many middle schoolers who do that at any other school. Um, as a community, we're focused on raising leaders through our core values and what we have noticed over the years is that our students need and deserve to continue that character development and educational journey at REACH beyond sixth grade all the way through eighth grade. The middle school years of seventh and eighth grade are crucial to the development of oneself. The students at REACH come from all over the Inland Empire and beyond for the educational experience that we provide. There are many options for high schools, but middle schools are limited and we want to provide the REACH experience for students through eighth grade. We are determined to continue the development of leaders who can carry the values of leadership, excellence, resilience, service, responsibility, and gratitude into high school and beyond. We are asking for your support in permitting us to allow for REACH to educate students not just through sixth grade, but to open a middle school that will serve hundreds of more students all the way through eighth grade expanding our community to even more deserving students. Thank you. Thank you, Carla Sanchez. Our next speaker is Roy Blackert, followed by Sean Ruiz, followed by Christina Saho. Welcome, Mr. Blackert. You have three minutes. I've attended all, I mean, probably a gazillion public meetings in parts of seven decades. I've never seen anything more obvious that a public body should do. Not only pass this charter for K through six and the expansion, you should extend the reach all the way to 12th grade. <laughs> what I'm pointing out is the lack of leadership, the lack of vision 
on this dais, in this executive staff. If you'd been following this or you'd been tracking it, you would have already been proposing this. You would have been saying, how can we, not only how can we help reach, how can we prevent what happened at this board meeting on the last one when you hear the schools you're responsible for and the teachers and the students, more importantly, telling you what's going on and the parents versus what's happening today, this evening? I really don't know. It amazes me how you can come and sit at this dais and how the staff members can sit here and look at that and not say anything and not tell the truth. And not come up like the brave teachers that did before and actually did and told you what was going on. It's the environment you create that prevents that. It's the environment, that, the difference is the environment the REACH folks have created where the kids actually want to go to school. Where they actually are learning. Where the parents are not scared to freaking death every day they drop their kids off to school because they don't know if they're going to come home. That's the stark reality of the situation. We've seen it happen far too many times. Sometimes I hear, oh, it's so difficult to this. No, it's not. You see it. You even feel it here today. But you sit there paralyzed, not doing any action. Where is it going to be on the agenda? Where are those discussions going to be? Not only are you doing this, but expanding it, because you're seeing the examples of what should be, what can be, the prevention of it, in a lot of cases, is you right here. All right, our next speaker is Sean Ruiz, followed by Christina Sejo, followed by Marjean Brown. Yes, well, welcome, Sean. You have three minutes. Hello, and my name is Sean Ruiz. I'm a PE coach here at REACH. Uh, before, well, as I begin, I just want to honor you guys. I don't know everything you do, but I know that you guys do a lot of work. And so I'm not here to bash on you. If anything, I'm honored to be here before you guys and this family behind me. So we have a special culture here. Part of that culture roots from our house system. When a new staff or student joins this school, they are given a team, a family that they can belong to. Each house represents a powerful quality, greatness, generosity, friendship, vision, courage, and hope. We are united and have teams that become bridges for us to bond with each other, staff and students and students and staff. It is a tradition here to have the entire school sing together chants, dance, and to finish with the Pledge of Allegiance. This keeps a strong unity between staff and students, and we are reminded every week, one house, one love. At REACH, every staff member contributes to the vision of the school. Like a family, we are all different, but we connect to the same path and support what is happening here. We do this because we believe in the work that we do. We believe in and see the leaders that come out of this school. Many leave to middle school and we see them uh, have success because we set them up to thrive, not just to survive. Now talking about a middle school, we know and I believe that they will be able to thrive into high school as well. In life, there are some things that we can't fully describe with words. Some things need to be experienced. REACH is one of those things. We have excellent admin, team leads, and staff. And obviously, we have excellent parents, too. I have never been surrounded by so much talent, humility, honor, and respect. And our desire is to provide the best and most excellent quality education for students, the best service to the communities around us and to the families by making resources available to many. To conclude, why should REACH get this seven years approved for renewal? Uh, it's because here at REACH, everyone grows. It is truly an honor, once again, to share my statement. And I urge you guys 
to approve both the renewal for our elementary school and the material revision of the Middle School of Reach Leadership STEAM Academy. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Our last three public comments are Christina Sehov. I hope I Did you have a Demetrius Williams? A Demetrius? No? I haven't seen that. I haven't seen, I haven't seen that one. Maybe didn't get filled out. Okay. Christina, uh, follow, uh, followed by Marjean Brown, followed by Michelle Kinsman. Welcome, Christina. You have three minutes. Yeah. Good evening, dear members of the Riverside Unified School District Board. My name is Christina Sahov, and as everybody was starting it, I am a proud mother of two boys. Both of my sons are attending Rich Leadership Steve Academy. My youngest son is in the first grade. My oldest have been going to reach for seven years. Um, my, um, my oldest son is gonna be graduating this year, which is I'm very happy, but at the same time, I'm, I'm very sad, especially after hearing all that. Honestly, I'm going above, uh, beyond my speech, but it's really sad. Unfortunately, it will not be a middle school for year 2023, 2024. Um, REACH is not just an elementary school. It is a successful learning community. We're highly trained teachers and the staff members creating a learning environment and providing an excellent education. At REACH, teachers are promoting collaborative interaction with their scholars. They inspire students to develop critical thinking and um, leadership skills. They encourage everyone to take initiative to become a knowledgeable and intelligent student. This year, REACH is celebrating 10 years anniversary. As a parent, I was happy to witness the continuous growth and development with the REACH team. Dr. Renty is an excellent leader. She provides guidance, motivation, and unifies all the teachers, all the staff members, and the students to work towards the same goals. My boys enjoy attending REACH. They do enjoy it. Um, they gladly participate in multiple events and extracurriculum activities. As was mentioned, they did start the soccer and they're really happy about that. <laughs> my oldest likes math, my youngest likes science. Of course, they all like PE. Every day on my way home, my kids share with me everything they learned during this day and everything they accomplished at school. And truly, this is my happiest moment of the day. And even if I'm tired, I'm really happy to hear that. When I was choosing the school for my children, I was looking for three essentials, essential elements. Number one was safe and friendly environment. Number two, high quality education. And number three, it was emo emotional stability and happiness for my kids. Rich Leadership STEAM Academy is incorporating and providing all three elements to my boys and hundreds of other kids. I am noticing a tremendous amount of the time, effort and dedication from the rich staff members in the, all that time they're investing into the students. I appeal you to grant them that um, seven years renewal and the material revision for the Rich Middle School, uh, School Academy because I really want my young. Thank you, Christina, thank you. Our last two comments are from Marjean Brown and Michelle Kinsman. Welcome, Ms. Brown, you have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Marjan. To the Board of Education, thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of the school that has played such a pivotal role in the lives of so many families, including my own. I'm the proud parent of two REACH students, Savannah, grade five, bedtime eight o'clock, Justice, grade three, bedtime 7.30. You see how important this is to us. Both of whom have attended REACH since kindergarten. As a passionate supporter of education, I wholeheartedly endorse the seven-year charter renewal and material revision for the middle school expansion being proposed. REACH has established itself as a beacon of excellence and diversity in our community, offering comprehensive and engaging curriculum that instills a love of learning in its students. I often laugh when I share with people how much my children love REACH. If there was a REACH university, they would wholeheartedly stay there until they completed their doctoral work. The proposed expansion for REACH's middle school program will provide our children with two additional years of academic, personal, and social growth, allowing them the opportunity to reinforce their relationships without having to adjust to a new environment due to an all, during an already difficult and awkward stage in life. This will be a 
with this will be pivotal to their development and leadership skills. This extended educational experience will give our children the opportunity to explore their interests, engage with their peers and teachers, and discover their passions. I attended private schools my entire life and was afforded many opportunities growing up. The one thing my parents could not provide me was with a diverse learning environment. The diversity my children experience day to day is unmatched. As a parent, I want to give my children everything that I didn't have, and I've seen firsthand how REACH has enriched their lives. They eagerly look forward to attending school every day at 7.15 when the gates open and have gained a strong foundation in the years that they have spent there. The support and nurturing environment that REACH provides has allowed my children to thrive both academically and socially. I urge you to support the seven-year charter renewal and material revision for the middle school expansion. This will not only benefit our children, but also the entire community. REACH is a vital institution that is raising leaders has made a positive impact on our children's lives and has my unwavering support. Thank you. Thank you, Marjan. Our last public comment is from Michelle Kinsman. Michelle is, is Michelle Kinsman here? Okay, thank you. Uh, that uh, concludes our public input. Are there any clarifying questions? Uh, we, again, we will have uh, uh, other opportunities through the procedural process to deliberate further. Okay, I, I, I close the public hearing at 10.09. I really want to just express my appreciation for all of you to take the time and patience to share your deeply held passions and convictions for region. Thank you, Dr. Rennie, for your leadership. Okay. I'm going to call for a 10-minute uh, recess. Uh, we will re-adjourn at 10.20.
We are reconvening the meeting at 1023. And we are shifting to the action portion of our agenda now. The first action item is a recommendation that the board adopt resolution number 2022 slash 23-79, which is a resolution of consideration with respect to changes to improvement area number three of community facilities district number 21 and resolution number 2022 slash 23-80, a resolution declaring necessity for community facilities district number 21 to incur bonded indebtedness in an increased amount. So I'll turn it over now to Mr. San Martin to lead us in this presentation. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, Board of Trustees. Um, we have three action items separate of those three action uh, items. Um, they have to do with community facilities districts, one that is existing, CFD 21. The second one is CFD 38, which is also existing, and CFD 41, which is a, a new CFD that we're asking the board to form. Tonight with us also Mr. Adam Bowers. He's our financial advisor with uh, Fieldman Rollup and Associates, and he's going to help us walk us through the all three action items. The first one is with CFD 21, and also with us is Runal Shaw. She's with BBK, our legal counsel. So with that, Mr. Adam Bowers. There you go. Great, thank you. And there's a presentation, if that could be brought up, please. Thank you. So while we have three presentations, we're going to get mostly done in the first one. I'm just going to show you what's different in the others to, we'll, as we go through here. So the first two items that you have are amendments to existing CFDs um, and what you've done that before. And essentially, the, the developers have agreed to pay you um, an excess of statutory fees, and then we try to do a CFD that works for their development and works for the new homeowners. As time passes, if they don't develop um, quickly, things change, and that's exactly what's happened here. So for the first one here, uh, we have uh, the proposed amendments. We'd adjust the rates. We'd adjust the not to exceed amount with the larger homes and higher prices that are able to generate more there. And then we're going to increase the term of the tax. And so those are the things that we have detailed there in that first, first piece. Um, we are going to maintain the effective tax rate per your goals and policies. Um, and you see that listed there. This first one is a little bit longer of a process to, for the amendment because we have the change in the authorized maximum. I'm going to show you how the next one differs from that to some degree. But you've seen this list before. It's just like a formation. We just have different terminology associated with it. Oops. Here are the terms, the 66.6% uh, premium that you've seen before. And then this one is a very small one. You wouldn't even form this one today. This was done before we set that minimum threshold of 70. And so you can see here it's 64 units, but since it was already formed and in place, amending it um, was the recommendation. And you can see here they have pretty large units, uh, 3,900 to 4,500 4, with pretty high price points there. Where is this project? You can see there, there's some uh, points at the Ginger Creek Drive and Roadrunner Trail, looks like to both to the north of that. Um, Woodcrest Elementary, Miller Middle, and King High School are the boundaries. On this chart, uh, I want to show you what the amendments look like. So that middle column is before. That's what it would be if you took no actions today. Uh, the right there is the after. You can see what, one of the things the developer wanted to do is these are all very large homes and they want to make it very simple to explain. So every home would pay the same special tax rate. And that's what you see there. They'll be funding for RUSD and also Western Municipal Water District. And you can see that to the far right there as well. Finally, schedule. We have the May 18th. Uh, and that's the item before you this evening, and that's your resolution of consideration. On June 29th, we'd come back with a resolution of change, and then you have your second reading in, on the July 20th meeting. And so that's the first one. I should probably pause, let you ask any questions, and take any actions. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Uh, before we do that, I want to turn to Trustee Hunt. Do we have any public com comments? Okay, um, so at this time, I'll turn it to my colleagues. Uh, if there's any comments or questions for Mr. Bauer. Okay, it's, it's uh, Trustee Kinnear. I make a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second by Trustee Hunt, please vote. Thank you, and the motion uh, passes unanimously. Our next action item 
is a recommendation that the board adopt resolution number 2022-23-81, a resolution of consideration with respect to changes to community facilities district number 38. And I'll turn it to Mr. San Martin or Mr. Bauer. Mr. Bauer. Great. So in our next one, another presentation looks very similar to the last. And yeah, this one is for the CFD number 38 amendment. That can come up. Uh, one of the differences here is we're not increasing the max authorization. And that's uh, on this page right here. We don't have that listed. Um, and then, but one thing, two things I want to correct here is we do not have the third bullet point, the approval declaring necessity to exceed additional amounts, and the, the one, one, about six down, the maximum bond indebtedness. We had a carryover. Those should not be on this slide. So the process is just two items shorter than the last one. Uh, these units are more typical of, uh, if you go down that last bullet point there, we have 260 units and we have anywhere from 1,500 to 2,882 with, I think, more typical home prices there of 617 to 713. You can see this, uh, this one is uh, non-contiguous. You can see the blue boxes or what number of different shapes there that highlight it's all within the general region, but certainly not all next to each other. These students would attend Mark Twain Elementary, Miller Middle, and King High. So a lot of development in that area. And then the special tax rates, same charts as before, but just kind of showing you what's taking place. Middle column and that table to the left is where rates are today, should you take no action. To the right of that is after an amendment. And then you can see we're funding a number of items on there, uh, Riverside USD facilities, West Minnesota Water District, and then city fees and facilities as well. Same schedule. And so now I'll pause and let you take any necessary actions. Trustee Hunt, do we have any public input? I turn to my colleagues if there's any comments or questions, otherwise we can entertain a motion. Motion by Trustee Hunt, seconded by Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Please vote. And the motion carries unanimously. The last action item of uh, our evening is a recommendation for the board to consider adopting resolution numbers 2022 slash 23 dash 36, declaring intention, and number 2022 slash 23 dash 37, declaring necessity for the formation of Community Finance District 41. Mr. Bauer. So if we can get to the next presentation where it says resolution of intention for CFD number 41, this process is very similar. We're actually forming this. There's no CFD in place now. And if we get this next slide here, we're doing uh, Riverside U.S. facilities and also county facilities. If you recall, we started this one and staff was working on it, but the county, it takes a long time to get the county JCFA, Joint Community Facility Agreement. And so we paused, got that mostly in place. You would make your adoption, then they make their adoption, but um, they've agreed to the terms and are ready to move forward. So we're in a good place to um, continue. Schedule looks very similar, just different terminology here as the first presentation I showed you. And so you can see all those listed there. Uh, finally, on our next slide here, we show this is a 489-unit project. You can see a little bit smaller units here, 917 to 1,600. And you can see the special tax range are a little bit lower here, 1,145 to 2,207. And then as you see the far right, we're breaking this out into two improvement areas. These work essentially like their own financing districts, um, but you can see there to the far right how we have those detailed there as well. On this slide, we show you the uh, map of the area, Center Street to the north, California to the west, Spring to the south, Garkfield to the east. And these would be within High Grove Elementary, University Middle School, and North High. Same schedule. And both Ms. Shaw and I are available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Trustee Hunt, do we have any public input on this? Okay, I'll turn to my colleagues for any comments or questions, or we can entertain a motion. Motion by Trustee Hunt. Second. Second by Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. And the motion carries unanimously. This brings us to our report portion of, of the agenda, which is a, a report on the local control and accountability plan. Dr. Perez, if you can take us through the presentation, please. Good evening, Dr. Fruk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. Uh, Dr. Christopher and I are um, presenting on the um, LCAP update for this evening, so I'll hand it off to Linda from here as the presentation comes up. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. 
We'll have a very brief update for you on the LCAP, and we're excited to share with you the progress we've made. As you know, we spend a great deal of time with our partner feedback themes. We engage in the community with our parent groups, with our local community members, and also with our parents and students. And then we seek their feedback and prioritize what they tell us, and we utilize it to plan for the LCAP each year. We also take the recommendations and make adjustments for all of the actions and services. And as you know, we have 65 actions and services, and um, they're all re reviewed and revisited and refurbished and refreshed every year. And then we'll just talk about the next steps that will be happening within the month of June. Most of you also know that our percentage of unduplicated students in the district is 74%. Unduplicated students are English learners, low income, and foster youth. The unduplicated students are only counted once, even though they, make, they may um, meet more than one of the criteria. The funds, the LCEFF funds for LCAP must be principally directed to improve or increase services for unduplicated students. And I believe that you're all aware of our board approved goals that we set forth in 2021, which last for three years. Engage students in high quality learning by a diverse, highly qualified staff. Provide students choices that prepare them for college and career pathways. Involve the whole community in, in student learning and well-being. And we have a process, and we use this process every year. We engage with educational partners. We spend a great deal of time with LCAP town halls, as you know, meetings, presentations, surveys. Then we progress monitor all of the expenditures. So I meet regularly with our action leads. Our action leads are here tonight. And we take a look at the expenditures and the progress that they've made toward goals. Then we measure that progress in goals with the metrics against the metrics that they've set forth at the beginning of the year to see what growth has been made. And then the reporting and accountability is actually the LCAP itself. And it's about 280 pages long. This year, we uh, reached one of our goals, about 25,000 data points that came from seven community town halls, eight high school focus groups, parent surveys, student survey, employee surveys, and the mandated culture and climate survey. We also engaged with our parent advisory groups. As you can see, our LCAP, our DLAC parent group that we meet with twice a year, the Riverside PTA, our district African-American parent advisory, special education community, our bargaining units, our family resource families, and also our Hispanic parents' families. We've shared this slide before, so just a quick refresh. We um, have a parent survey that is uh, strictly aligned to the LCAP goals. That's the first one out of the gate each year. And we had um, several areas of strength and areas of growth bubble to the surface that we took into great consideration as we prepared this year's LCAP and the high school focus groups. The high school students also that participate in the, the focus group take a survey as well. And so we use all of that data to inform the areas of strength and areas of growth. And I think that you'll see when we talk about what's coming up for this year that we've really been listening and we really care and we really um, take into consideration all of the feedback. We also had the town hall feedback from uh, our different town halls. Seven, um, we had seven all together, five in person, seven online. And we heard some, some same themes that we hear most years, clean, safe bathrooms, supportive learning environments. We want uh, more time with guidance counselors and SAP counselors, uh, love the extracurricular activities, and want to really have that college and career readiness piece all the time. And we also did an employee survey and we found that there were um, high expectations for our students from all of our employees. Again, placing we want a priority in college and career readiness, and the workplace was a positive environment. Areas for growth, as you can see, very similar in the past. A desire for more translation interpretation. Um, we want more art and CTE. We love what we have, but we want more. And um, additional professional development. And this year we also did what is called the mandated school culture and climate survey. We switched uh, vendors this year and we used a tool from Panorama. 
So these are slightly different from last year simply because it's a different tool, so the metrics look different. Um, we posted what scored favorably, so obviously if there's higher scores, that's positive favorably. If you see a lower percentage, that means there's some areas of challenge and growth that we need to take a look at. Um, we do want to call out that there's an interesting um, combination on the families score. They scored 79%, uh, noting that the barriers to engagement are becoming less and less and not so much a problem. However, the family engagement score was only 17%. Now, we also did look into the national average on this, and Panorama reports that the na national average on family engagement is 19%. So uh, we are in that field of average, but we can obviously want to work towards um, increasing those. And then we're going to highlight some adjustments uh, that we are making in our actions. So we themed the actions tonight, academic supports, school safety, and engagement. And again, I have the action leads joining us tonight. Thank you again for coming, everybody. And uh, they will be able to field any um, questions or answers that you may have later on. So for academic supports, in STEM, our actions that are part of STEM and math, we will be increasing our structured math courses and we will be adding uh, around 10 teachers and three TOSAs. For professional growth systems, we will be adding additional employees, a director and some support teachers and really launching our classified PGS program. Um, in our English learner language proficiency, we are adding four additional TOSAs to help with increase our ling language proficiency scores. We also are adding a DLI coordinator. We're expanding career technical education, bringing in some CTE liaisons and some uh, staff to help us really work on getting those work, um, workplace experiences up and ready to go and increasing our, our presence with our partners out in the community. And also adding um, uh, some additional uh, construction tech and auto courses. Heritage, Legacy, and Puente programs, we are looking at expanding into the ninth grade. And for safety, we are adding 31 new campus supervisors, which also includes extensive training for the campus supervisors. For multi-tiered systems of support, we're adding four additional uh, MTS liaisons to help at school sites to, again, create that, that um, deeper level of implementation of MTSS. For all, fil all facilities in good repair, we are adding six additional custodians to help with school uh, cleanliness, to um, help meet that desire from our parents. And then our school site allocations are based on the formula of how many unduplicated students attend each site. This year, we did find some cost savings along the way through our progress monitoring, and so we gave additional allocations this year around March. And if they were unable to spend that because we had some, um, that, some purchasing deadlines, we are allowing them to keep it and keep that extra boost that they got in March throughout the rest of the year. And our Family Resource Center will be really helping us with that family engagement uh, piece. We really want to make sure that we're really reaching out and, and meeting the needs of the families and sense, uh, creating that sense of warmth and desire for them to come and be a part of their school families. Uh, for AP testing fees, we are planning to um, pay for all of the AP testing fees across the district. In school activities, School Plus 2 is proving to be very successful. We want to continue that. Also, I'll add in here, uh, we, were, we are looking to pay for the science camp fees for sixth grade as well. And then our student assistant program, we are creating another team. So that's going to um, add three more school psychologists and five prevention assistants to round out that SAP team. So our next steps, uh, we did submit our LCAP to the county for its fast pass review last Friday. On June 8th, we'll be back here for the LCAP public hearing. It does go on public view the week before June 8th. And on June 29th, we will have the LCAP adoption here for you as well. So that's the brief presentation. And after the public comments, um, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. So, uh, Trustee Hunt shares with me two uh, uh, public input, Roy Blecker, f uh, followed by Sandy R. Welcome, Mr. Blecker. You have three minutes. 
What a contrast between the last presentation we've seen and the one before. The one before I actually got some information about LCAP, which has to do with spending versus student achievement and things like that. You saw the difference between the reach, three, four, hundred percent better than what you're doing. I would say scrap that plan you got because it ain't working. What more evidence do you need that what's been happening, not only in this school district, but all across the state of California and the nation? But it's been led by California said it many times, all the nutcase ideas start here because they test pilot them here. Don't let the cancer of California spread across the 49 states. So when you look at that, you looked at, and what was on your survey? We, one of the biggest concerns was have students, our kids, college and career ready. You don't see anything in your report about 127 and how it relates to education. It's been a theory for 100 years. It will work 100 years into the future. What you're not doing is applying what we already know into how the education works. 10 years ago, we were only spending 8K a student in the state. Now we're spending 24 grand. That's 300% three times more, and we're getting half the results. Why doesn't that explained in the LCAP? Why didn't you submit that to the County Board of Education? Why didn't you submit it when Corey Jackson was there? And now he's up to the legislature, and we'll deal with that in the next agenda item. You want to know why things are going wrong? This is exactly why. I wonder if the staff that made that report watched the report of the REACH folks. I wonder if they'll take any lessons from that. I wonder if you'll put some direction to doing things like that. Maybe you won't have some of the concerns and the problems. And we're here at 11 o'clock and we ain't even done yet. More proof, y'all are not doing your job. If it's taken this long, you should be having more meetings. If you're having problems, you should be getting more people and more ideas to figure out what's going on. What you don't see is that 98.7% of the time. And then you wonder why, or you make excuses, or you point fingers when the fingers, when, the, when where you should be looking is in the mirror, because 98.7% of the time that's... Thank you. Our next public input is from Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. So one of the things that I really think for the LCAP that needs the most improvement is the engagement the engagement with parents, and also the engagement with students. Because if you look back at that presentation, you see how many parents responded, you see how many staff responded, you see how many people were at the town hall. Tell me how many students responded. I can tell you, because I was at the LCAP meeting just a couple, what, weeks ago? And I pointed out that that number was low, and now that number's not on this presentation. And it should be. And that, to me, that feels like you're trying to hide how low that student engagement number was. And I think that's important because just like you guys try to say sometimes, oh, their voices are so important, but yet you didn't engage them. And then when I asked, how were these kids selected? How did you pick these kids? Well, the principal sent some kids from the ASBs. Well, I don't think that the, the students should be selected by the principal. Number one, because I think then you don't get a good mix. I think you should have a randomized sample and you say, okay, this kid, this kid, this kid, this kid, random. No, I'm going to send you the kids that are going to answer the way I want them to answer. I hope that you understand that. And I hope that you ask your staff how many students actually responded because you have 40,000 students. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up is one of the things that's affecting your performance, you say, is attendance. As a parent, we all got these. It's like a joke in, in our group. You spent, this is, this is from a friend who has twins, so they got two. And then, just like two days later, they got that you're doing great because you actually have great attendance. And then I have the parents who said, my kid got the elementary one that's like a trifold, but since my last name is a Hispanic name, 
It's in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. So how did she get a flyer in Spanish? You know, <laughs> she's like, it makes no sense to me. So again, this isn't what's going to solve the attendance problem. It's getting the kids engaged, getting the kids to care. I mean, you saw the difference. That reach group, they were engaged. The kids were excited. I, I can't pull kids from your schools to want to come here. They don't want to come to the board meetings to talk. They're not. They, they, that's a problem. You, you should be able to say, our kids want to come and tell you about how great your schools are. But I do want to say, the reason that you never saw me here before and I've only been here the last three years is because my kids went to Lake Matthews. Lake Matthews is a great school and Ms. Williams was an amazing principal and you know, Ms. Resputic is, has big shoes to fill and she's doing good and Ms. Carmel is amazing. And a lot of those teachers here tonight were from Lake Matthews. They're teachers that my kids had and that- Thank you, thank you Ms. R. Okay, I'll turn to my colleagues now for uh, comments, questions uh, regarding this uh, presentation. Mr. Uh, Trustee Hunt. Thank you very much. Uh, doctor, I, I was impressed with the, the school culture and climate survey and the responses you had, um, almost 17,000 from our students. Um, and that's up quite a bit. What do you attribute their, um, their interest, their renewed or accelerated, uh, escalated interest? Thank you. I think um, probably just, yes, in general, increased interest, but I can also ask Sean. Um, he is uh, the, dire the director for Ray who conducted that particular mandated survey. If you wanna join me here. Good evening. Um, so as far as the, the culture and climate survey, it is a, a survey that we did and it was, we were able to push it out one by email to the students so that they just clicked on their, their link and they were able to take it. And plus it was a lot shorter than surveys in the past. So we did have quite a bit of respondents than, than in the past year, about a thousand more so. I, I noticed in here that one of the things that the young people were asking for is uh, modern texts from diverse authors. Do you, can you go into some detail there? Did they share that? I mean, at a time when so many are wanting to myopically ban, you know, Catcher in the Rye or Mockingbird and all those, what are the young people telling us about that? So in, in regards to this particular survey, those questions weren't asked in that survey, so I would have to defer. Thank you. Yeah, Anisha, would you like to come on up? So we found in the focus groups that they were looking for something um, that was more modern and they wanted diverse authors that reflected the population attending the school and had more up-to-date stories that also reflected the cultures and their backgrounds. So what we've been doing for the last few years- Anisha, to take a minute to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm Anisha Camacho. I'm a teacher on special assignment for secondary ELA and world language. Um, for the last about four years, we've been doing an equity audit in all of the literature that we offer in RUSD. Mm -hmm. With that has been an update to the process of how do we update our novels that are more current. Thinking about American Library Association recommendations, Nobel Prize winners, how do we have some of those reflected? And then also looking at alignment to the state framework. When students come to us with surveys like this, we use those surveys in order to start that process of updating our novel list. So currently we do have some modern texts, seventh through 12th grade. We also have some Native American, American Indian reflection, um, Asian Pacific Islander reflection in our novel list. The goal is really to have teachers feel comfortable with these new novels and to make those connections so that students feel like they're reflected and they're using those books as windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors that they see themselves, they see other people, and it builds empathy. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. I appreciate it. Do we have Raisin in the Sun among our... We do have Raisin in the Sun. Maya Angelo. Yes, we do. Just want to be sure that we're... Absolutely. Not and just getting away from some of the classics as well. But and looking at text pairings, how do we pair, pair classics with modern text as well? Thank you both. Appreciate Welcome. the answer. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Do any other colleagues have... Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. There I am. Uh, thank you. I just have a, a couple of uh, points, that's some things that I highlight. I just kind of wanted to see if I can get some clarity from um, the LCAP team. 
extraordinary work. I've received all of the work, and it's, it's, there's a lot there. So there's a lot of really good data that we're gathering to the point that we're not afraid of gathering data. We're not afraid of hearing that there are some places for opportunity, you know, namely English learners, low-income families, and foster youth. Uh, you know, we scored a little low, and, and the district provides adequate for these. Um, so, you know, to our point, we're, we're good at looking at where our needs are. Um, so I wanted to point out that uh, generally parents said that their camp they feel like their campuses are safe and secure, and I was happy to see that. I was happy to see that there was a positive relationship with teachers. Um, and that's evident. Um, so I was happy about that. Um, one of the things that, that I did notice is that there is, a, in the employee survey, they stated that there, there was a need for sufficient staffing for translators and onboarding of new staff. I think that's hopefully something that uh, we're working with with our, um, with our professional growth systems and our MTSSs. Um, but I, is, that, is that like a need for more cl classified staff? Would that be in the classified staff? arena or is it just is it considered faculty I'm um, sorry it's uh, it's certificated both, it's both it's both classified and okay. certificated so then my last question is um, in the panorama culture climate survey uh, teachers said that they um, they scored favorably on teacher reflection and I'm curious as to what that is I'll have Sean come back up sorry real quick okay. So if you can repeat that the, the, on I'm just teacher curious as to what uh, teacher reflection is on, in the climate survey under teachers scored favorably in feedback responder groups. So there were student responder groups and teacher responder groups and teachers scored favorably at 68% that they liked teacher reflection. I'm curious as to what that right. is. So the, uh, an example of a question that was asked, like how confident are you that you can help your students or your school's most challenging students to learn? That would be an example of a question that was asked to get them to reflect. And then also thinking about growth mindset in particular, how confident are you that you can support your students' growth and development? So that's kind of the context that they're asking and, and students to reflect on that and then give an answer. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Dr. That was the only group that had that question, so oh, okay. it was unique to teachers. Thank you. Does that conclude your, your comments, Dr. hernandez Elsner? Okay. Trustee Kinnear, is there something you want to add? Yeah, just, just a couple of comments. Uh, I appreciate the time that, uh, that, uh, that you gave me in, in meeting with you and, uh, and, and Dr. Perez. That was, uh, that was helpful. So I really don't have any questions, but I do want to say a couple of things uh, publicly. Uh, first of all, I think the, the notebook it was, it was a great job. You're very, very organized. Um, it's thorough. It's comprehensive. Uh, it allowed me to, to look at all of our actions and, uh, and uh, um, get a glance of, of, of how we're doing. This is my third LCAP budget as a, as a board member, and I think our focus on metrics, our focus on using data to, to make determinations of how we're doing is, is, has gotten a lot better. Um, I encourage us as a, as a, as a staff across the board uh, to continue using metrics and to, to dive even more deeply into, uh, in, in, into their use. Uh, clearly developing a district culture, uh, 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 district data-driven culture is going to, uh, to, to drive our improvement efforts. So uh, I think a nice job with, uh, with, with, with all of this. Uh, I'd also, I said it before, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, acknowledge my concern, my concern with the survey results, uh, particularly the survey results that uh, that focus on on uh, you know half of our our, our teachers having concerns over uh, over uh, uh, safety and and climate and belonging, and uh, um, I'd look forward to the opportunity to to, uh, to to look at that more closely uh, this summer as we prepare for a new school year. Nice nice work. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Christopher. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Appreciate the time leading up to this meeting to just to prepare us all to make sure we understand the kind of the process and, and the changes in, in this LCAP. So um, only a few questions from me because you were you're so gracious in spending time before and answering those questions. But um, you touched upon uh, DLI and, and adding uh, an additional coordinator this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that program continues to grow. We're at seven schools, I think. Um, I know we're going to have a conversation about DLI, about uh, the future and, and how that looks. But um, what kind of support, in addition to that new DLI coordinator, uh, does the DLI program have? Sure. I think I'll ask Christy and oh, Jen. We'll have the experts come up to the dais. Thank you. So um, DLI schools, I think we're currently at 10, uh, 10. six elementary, three middle, and one high school, almost into two high schools. So we're, we're growing. We're very grateful to have that DLI coordinator uh, come on board to provide the um, uh, focused support on DLI rather than being split between a number of programs. Um, that position is also, or the program is also supported by a teacher on special assignment um, who helps to develop curriculum and provide um, professional development uh, for teachers. And I'm not sure I answered your question if you would repeat that, what you were asking. I mean, I, th I think that in terms of what the current support is and what it's going to be next year, how does a program, like a special program like DLI, compare to other specialty programs we have in, di in the district in terms of, of support from, from staff outside the classroom? That's a good question, and um, I think that my first blush answer would be that it's pretty comparable. Um, when you look at support for English learners, for our CTE program, um, for our STEM program, um, there, there's... They look different through different avenues, um, but, but I think that overall it's fairly comparable. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is um, uh, regarding our heritage and legacy program. And the, uh, and it's just because I know Rochelle's been up late. I don't want her to just sit there for no reason. <laughs> but this is a program that's uh, you know, been really successful and it's changed and it's expanded to serve a lot more students. Um, so with the thought of expanding into ninth grade, what will that look like for a ninth grade student and um, what kind of resources will be allocated in addition to what we're currently doing to support that? Yes, so first of all, Rochelle Cananza, our instructional specialist over targeted supports that includes Heritage and Legacy and AVID. Um, what we're looking to provide for our ninth grade students is a very targeted support plan where we individually analyze each student and um, identify based on their past performance whether or not they need academic support, support in attendance, discipline, or SEL. And then based on those individual plans, monitor and support them throughout the year. Okay, perfect. So will we see additional um, so, so allocation of site contacts or more FTEs, is that the, kind of the idea on how to fill yep. that? Okay. Absolutely, yes. All right, perfect. Um, my next question is regarding safety and the addition of uh, additional campus supervisors, um, but also in regards to AIDS and just the training. We heard from some, some parents and teachers this evening about um, not only the need for additional eyes on campus in terms of supervisors and, and AIDS, but that they're properly trained in some of the challenges that we're facing in, in today's classrooms. Is, is there any changes in this LCAP to support those ideas? Right, I'll have Raul come up and just put an exclamation point on some of this information, but as you saw, we have 31 campus supervisors that we will be hiring, and that also comes with additional dollars to train them very extensively, um, and then their training can assist other campus um, personnel as well. Good evening, Darwin Layala, Director of People Services. And so yes, as she mentioned, we're adding additional campus supervisors. There is a requirement for them to receive training, 24 hours of training that is developed, that we are scheduling. I'm very thankful for the support that the board has provided to us because we do have a liaison as well uh, in Floyd that is gonna help us lead the very specific targeted PD that they need to do their job effectively. 
um, and we're also surveying them to uh, survey those specific needs apart from what's required. So have we heard from campus supervisors any feedback or, or surveys from them in regards to like, hey, I really wish I knew more about this or hey, we're struggling with this. I'm not sure how to handle it. I don't remember it in the training. Have we, have we made adjustments to the training or are adjustments needed in the training? Yes, we certainly have. Okay. Uh, we've surveyed them on a couple different occasions and we were then responded to those survey results. An example, uh, there was a need for de-escalation strategies. So we brought, worked with the DA, brought in an expert to teach the, um, them through some of those de-escalation strategies. Okay, good, that's a good example. And then how about in regards to the aids? Are the one-on-one -on -one aids and instructional aids um, provided any different, additional training? Yeah, different classification I'd have right. to defer to. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Kirsten Frosto, Director of Pupil Services and Special Education. And yes, our instructional assistants in special education receive training in a number of areas, including academics, but also behavior. So they receive uh, two and a half days, many of them in de-escalation strategies. And then also at the, we are working on a plan in collaboration with human resource personnel on um, orienting all of our staff at the beginning of the year and a couple of days throughout during our non-student days. So during parent conferences, during grading days for staff, then we pull all of our um, paraprofessionals together and provide them that ongoing training. Perfect, thank you, Kirsten. Um, next question, or I uh, thought, is about the STEM and math supports. So I mean, we've heard also this, of big demand for parents and students. Um, you know, it seems to be very helpful for help helping kids think critically and preparing them for whatever they do next. Uh, also good for engagement. So um, what types of, could just share a few in detail about things regarding our STEM and math supports. Sure. Dr. Sosa or Dr. Kong. Good evening, Steve Kong, Director of Curriculum and Assessment. So specific to some of the math supports that uh, Dr. Christopher mentioned, we'll be onboarding some elementary math TOSAs. These TOSAs will be supporting some of our school sites by modeling uh, some coaching strategies, instructional strategies, but also um, working on small group intervention for our students and modeling the best practices that teachers can relay back. On top of that, we're also adding our um, structured math classes as well and those will be in our high schools. Perfect, thank you. Um, last on CTE. So again, it's been a popular subject as well. Can you just share a few of the sure. specific changes in CTE in this, in this and, and why we're implementing those changes? I'm sorry, what would you like to know, Mr. Hunt? Or Mr. The, sorry the, uh, the, the additions uh, for the, 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 addition, the additional funds for CTE. So we have a, a wide-ranging plan. Um, our, our two CTE TOSAs are moving from grant funding into uh, district funding to kind of uh, solidify the work that they're doing. Um, we're continuing our contract with uh, Pathful uh, Explorer, the um, career exploration uh, online program for the next five years. And then a lot of the additional funds will either go to the classroom and we're still creating some of the plans for the additional funds that went beyond that you were so gracious to give us a couple months ago. So some of those plans are still in the works, but the money that was first initially allocated is, is already allocated and ready to go for the next, uh, next go round. Okay, so, so. The mo so mo mostly the changes are just to put ongoing commitment to, to these uh, Correct. programs, I see. Correct. Okay. And then of course, uh, Dr. Christopher mentioned um, auto tech and construction and just trying to be able to open those doors for students that are not at Ramona or Lincoln to come in in the afternoon and utilize those facilities as well. So that's something that we're, we're actively pursuing for next, next uh, fall. Perfect, yeah. all right, thank you. Sure. All right, yeah, thank you, Dr. Christopher. That, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, I just have a couple of thoughts. I, my colleagues really covered a lot of ground. Uh, one, uh, I just wanna begin by just saying, uh, to echo, uh, what Trustee Kinnear mentioned, just the, the depth uh, and uh, dedication that all of you put into this, and I appreciate you know your guys' patience to staying here, but it's, it's very evident, uh, the, uh, again, the effort that the staff has put into in increasing the efforts with the LCAP, uh, so I really want to applaud that. Um, my f first question is, is 
I like how, because uh, one of my concerns always with the LCAP feedback was, what's the, the demographics and profile of the input we're getting, how representative is it of the broader student population? I like that we did the student focus groups to like zero in on uh, some of those things like low-income English learners. But um, have we done something similar with the parents? I'd, if I missed it? Um, <clears throat> we, we tracked the parent survey by um, cluster or feeder group mm -hmm. from the five comprehensive high schools. So um, you, the parent would go on and they would click which school that their children attend. And if they had three children, they could take it three times. I, I meant in the sense of like low-income English learners. I meant different aspects like that that could give us a, uh, what, right. what's the representation that we're getting out of this. So we, we have not asked that specifically. We've just asked the feeder group and, and cluster and school site. <clears throat> and, and so, um, but we do have an open-ended question. We have a series of open-ended questions at the end okay. that do ask um, how the district is meeting the needs of those particular unduplicated student groups. This is something to consider. I think do, doing comparable focus groups with parents mm -hmm. uh, would, might be, you know, might give us some interesting data. Um, the last thing I'll just say is, uh, you know, I really hope, again, that we look at the whole continual process. We're getting the input from all, all of our stakeholders. It's obviously has some degree of reflection into the uh, budget allocations and the LCAP plans itself. And then it's important that we circle back again and share with the community, okay, this is what you guys asked for. This is what, how we're responding. That is, that part of it is a important part of your outreach and engagement, correct? Correct. Okay, so th thank you for doing that. Um, and that, I have to switch, sorry. Uh, so I, uh, that concludes, I can't see, my apologies. Okay, okay. That, so that does conclude our, all of our board member comments. Thank you, Dr. Thank Christopher. You. Thank and you. I just I've wanted to tell you a quick thank you again to all of our our, our leads that came out tonight. So thank you so much. Yeah. They do a great work for LCAP and thank you to the board for all of your support. Thank you guys again for everything. Uh, so this brings us to our meeting conclusion. And so uh, I'll check with my colleagues. Do we have, we have public input? We have uh, one public comment, Roy Blecker. Welcome, Mr. Blecker, do you have three? You need items to put on the agenda. Number one, let's start with putting on the agenda how we're going to deal with the school violence, not only at King and everywhere else that's going on in here. Let's put on a resolution to repeal AB 1266, you know what that is? That's the start of all this boys and the girls bathroom stuff on that. Why don't you work on that with our legislatures? Why don't you oppose AB 274 and ask for the repeal of SB 419 that started all this suspension crap? You want to fix our schools? Oppose 1299 AB by the infamous Corey Jackson. Wants to eliminate the, all the SROs out of schools. You know what that is? Oppose, oppose AB 1078. Another Corey Jackson, he wants to take all the curriculum, all the books, and send it up to Sacramento. He wants to strip your ability to do it. Why don't you put that on the agenda? Along with Corey Jackson's infamous AB 742 to take canines away from the police departments, you know, that could be something. What if a kid gets hurt or injured or a teacher because we got rid of the canines out of law enforcement? Why don't you put on the agenda and why don't you get the staff that's right over here to put out a report on how we're going to raise the student achievement? The REACH people seem to have it figured out. 
That's not on your agenda. I can see what's on Ms. Alexander's agenda in a lot of years. Nodding on the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Boy, you were paying right attention to that. That's not a problem. Why don't you support a Saley's bill, AB 1314? Allows parents to be notified if their kids are getting gender surgery or hormone blockers. You don't think parents don't have a right to know that? Why don't you put out a resolution opposing that or supporting that legislation? Once there's nine solutions for you to get to where we should be, you're not doing your job and the kids are suffering. Okay, uh, Trustee Hunt, you requested a speech. Thank you. Uh, actually, if I may, uh, this is actually some items I'd ask the superintendent to look into. I found out that the California Department of Education, under their forest system program, have $150 million in grants to, with intent to purchase trees for campuses. And as we know, a lot of our old campuses in particular uh, could use more shade. So if, if uh, Superintendent Hill's ha staff could look into that. And uh, I want to be sure that our, in our budgeting, Superintendent Hill, that Riverside Public Utilities uh, staff is now proposing and the City Council will soon be considering a very substantial rate increase for electrical power, which we know that utilities are about 8% of our budget now. So I want to be sure that as we're looking at the budget with your assistant superintendent that we're doing so. And I would like when we, as Mr. Lee was talking about, when we review the CTE programs, thank you, Mr. Weston, for being here. But in all seriousness, um, as we look at the ones we offer and the ones we may be thinking about in the future, with the alarming continued headlines about the advancement, rapid advancement of AI and the effect that it will have on careers, jobs, current jobs, uh, are, are we having programs that will be sustainable in future years and not training young people for, for buggy whips, so to speak? So uh, I just appreciate if we have those when they, when they can make the agenda, that'd be fine. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Uh, so that, that will lead us to now our adjournment. Uh, we conclude the board meeting at 11.15 p.m. and we adjourn in the memory of Jackie Davis, a retiree of our school district. <laughs>